and the investigation of Daniel Ellsberg. Mr. Nixon shrouded all these activities with the respectable cloak of national security, while confessing that confessing some of them got a little out of hand. Now his former attorney general and chief political confidant contemptuously describes them as horrors and rejected the suggestion that they involved national security. After Mr. Mitchell's appearance, so helpful to Mr. Nixon otherwise, the latest definitive White House position, leaning heavily on the national security argument, will be harder to maintain. We'll be back tomorrow night. For my colleagues Peter Kay and Jim Lehrer, this is Robert McNeil. Good night for NPACT. From Washington, you've been watching gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association. <laughs> and the memories of a multitude of witnesses. And even the written word can be misunderstood. You may remember, Mr. Chairman, Elihu Root's insistence that in good legal drafting, the words you use must not only be consistent with what you mean, they must be inconsistent with any other meaning. Now, the chair reminds us that when two men communicate with each other by word of mouth, there is a, quote, twofold hazard in that communication. First, the man who spoke might not have expressed himself clearly and may not have said exactly what was in his mind. Secondly, even if he did express himself clearly, the man who heard may have put a different interpretation on the words than did the man who spoke them. The chairman's reminder is wise and sound, and I would recommend, if I may, with all respect, Mr. Chairman, that that sound principle should be known as Irvin's Law. In, <coughs> in December, and the typo here, it should be 1972 and January 1973, I was primarily involved with inaugural matters and recall no particular meetings or consultations with regard to the Watergate or related matters until February 6th. On that day, I attended a meeting in Mr. Ehrlichman's office to discuss our legislative position with respect to the proposed resolution creating this select committee. Except for the discussion at this meeting, I knew of no other planning or preparation that had been going on with regard to these hearings within the White House, and I was a critic of this lack of preparation. This may explain why I was called to the meetings in California on February 10 to 11. I had been home with the intestinal flu for two days and had been planning to take the weekend off and had reservations for my wife and family at the Greenbrier for the long February, long weekend of February 9 to 12. But late in the afternoon of February 9, Mr. Dean called me at home to say that we were both asked by Mr. Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman to meet with Mr. Haldeman and himself in San Clemente on February 10 to discuss the forthcoming Senate hearings. I therefore took my family and baggage to the far west instead of the south. Mr. Dean and I met on Saturday, February 10, 1973, at San Clemente with Messrs. Haldeman and Ehrlichman in Mr. Ehrlichman's office from 10.30 or 11 in the morning until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. On Sunday, we went to Mr. Haldeman's cottage at La Costa. All four of us were present for the majority of the time. One or more of us would leave the group on occasion to make a telephone call or perform some other function. Summarizing these meetings is difficult, 
because they involved about eight hours of conversation with none of the participants adhering to any strict agenda. In addition, the many things that were said during these sessions were heard by anywhere from two to four people, depending on who was absent at the moment, each person with a different background or degree of knowledge or point of view. It was, if you will, a situation where Irvin's law applied to the fourth power. With that prelude, let me now give you my best recollection of what transpired while I was present. At the outset, Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman, and I parenthetically, I sometimes find it hard to recall which was which, asked, <laughs> asked Mr. Dean and me what we had been doing to prepare for the hearings. The answer was nothing. The focus of, the, of these hearings, they said, would be the activities of the committee to re-elect the president, and it would be the committee that would have the primary responsibility for the defense. Had we had any, had we had any discussions, or as they put it, any input from John Mitchell? The answer was no. Either Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman then said that in that case, Dick Moore ought to sit down with John Mitchell as soon as he could and fill him in on the things that we discuss here and get Mr. Mitchell actively interested. He is the only one who could give real leadership to the people at the committee. Either Haldeman or Ehrlichman then suggested that Mr. Dean be the White House coordinator for the hearing and that I hold myself available to advise him. I suggested that the White House have a writer spokesman who could issue statements or go on television if necessary to reply quickly to testimony or commentary that was wrong or slanted. Mr. Dean, I believe, suggested that Pat Buchanan be this spokesman. The meeting then turned to a discussion of our relationship with the minority members of the committee. It was pointed out that in an ordinary hearing, there is an open relationship between the White House and the committee leadership of the same party, and the White House has a perfectly proper role in presenting its views to the members affiliated <coughs> with its party on the particular committee. No one in the group had any firm view as to what was appropriate here, but the general feeling was that since this was, in effect, an investigation of the administration, the normal relationship might not apply, and we probably should maintain an arm's length approach even to the Republican members. In any event, it was agreed that Wally Johnson, then of the White House Congressional Relations Staff, would be made available for whatever liaison with the committee might be appropriate. Early in the discussions, Mr. Ehrlichman made it clear that the President wanted our position in the hearing to be one of full cooperation, subject only to the doctrine of separation of powers. It was agreed it would be important to work out a statement on executive privilege. The President uh, had recently promised the press he would do this, a statement that would enable us to cooperate and supply the information that the select that the committee wanted, it is my recollection at this time, the question whether presidential advisors would be, would be permitted to appear was still unresolved, although the consensus was that appearances should be permitted where the subject matter did not relate to their official duties for the president. And parenthetically, some of the matters that are discussed here clearly would not relate to official duties. There was, as I have said, no prepared sequence to our discussions, and I cannot recall all the other subjects we discussed. I do recall a discussion about putting out a White House statement in advance of the hearings, setting forth all the known facts about the Watergate episode. It was also agreed that more manpower would be needed by the committee to re-elect the president, possibly in the form of young lawyers and researchers to review each day's testimony and prepare rebuttals. This was among the items I would discuss with Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Dean, of course, has testified about a discussion of money. His recollection differs from mine and again illustrates the principle which I have called Urban's Law. The brief mention of money made at this meeting may have had a very different significance to a person with Mr. Dean's knowledge of the circumstances than it had to a person with my lack of knowledge. My recollection on that subject is as follows that the subject came up, I believe, on the second day at the hotel. 
in the context of a discussion of the litigation uh, which the committee was then involved, John Dean, in a sort of by-the-way reference, said he had been told by the lawyers, and I think that was the way he put it, but I cannot be precise about his language, that they may be needing some more money. And did we have any ideas? Someone said, isn't that something that John Mitchell might handle with his rich New York friends? It was suggested that since I would be meeting with Mr. Mitchell, I should mention this when I saw him, and I said I would. As I look back now, of course, with the knowledge I subsequently began acquiring in the latter part of March, Mr. Diff Mr. Dean's reference to a need for money might well have stimulated some further inquiries on my part at La Costa. But I did not have that knowledge on February 11th. At that point, I knew nothing about any prior payments to any dependent defendants or the council. And no one else at the meeting went into any details, at least in my presence. Moreover, I had served for a year as special assistant to Mr. Mitchell at the Department of Justice, and I know him well. And I was certain that he wasn't about to be programmed into becoming a fundraiser by Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman, and I anticipated that Mitchell's answer would be no, as it turned out to be. We discussed several other matters at the meeting as it ended. And as I recall, uh, at the meeting, as it ended, and as I recall, with Ehrlichman asking me about my draft of the statement on executive privilege, he indicated that he would like a revised report to be prepared and cleared for review by the president on the flight east the next day. At some time during or just after the Sunday meeting, I called my secretary in Washington and dictated some changes in the statement to be cleared among those in Washington who were working on that draft. Mr. Dean has testified that we left the meeting together and that we had a conversation, he had a conversation with me, at which time he cautioned me against conveying this fundraising request when I saw Mr. Mitchell. I have absolutely no recollection of any such conversation and I am convinced it never took place. I returned to my office in Washington on February 13 and telephoned Mr. Mitchell to inquire whether he had any immediate plans to be in Washington. He said he did not. And I said I needed two or three hours with him to tell him about the meetings in California. He suggested I come to New York and we could take as much time as we needed. On February 15, I took a morning shuttle to New York, went to Mr. Mitchell's office, visited briefly before lunch, and after lunch, we had a discussion about the California meetings and the upcoming hearings. Now, knowing Mr. Mitchell as I do, I felt there were several points where he would, be, he would resist being programmed by the White House staff, as I mentioned earlier. And I elected to get those out of the way at the start. And at the beginning of our discussion, I said something like this. Well, you will be glad to know that the group in San Clemente thinks you should be taking a more active interest in the urban hearings. Uh, I had a somewhat blunt reply, such as, thank you. And as you know, uh, I am indeed interested in the urban hearings, and I may be a star witness. I told him it was also suggested uh, that it would be most helpful if he could spend part of each week in his law firm's Washington office. He made a chilly reply that, uh, he would come to Washington whenever he felt it was necessary. Then I said something to the effect that I didn't know what this was about, but that it had been suggested that the committee lawyers might be needing more money and that his White House friends had nominated him for the honor of being a fundraiser. I don't remember his exact words, but I believe he said something like, tell them to get lost. Uh, thereafter, uh, I began my report of the meeting. We had a wide-ranging discussion and a pleasant visit that lasted most of the afternoon. I left his office at about 4 or 5 o'clock and took the shuttle home. From mid-February to early March in 1973, I was not asked to participate in any follow-up to the La Costa San Clemente discussions about preparing for these hearings except for continuing my participation in the preparation of the statement on executive privilege. By the beginning of March, the Gray nomination hearings had become a major preoccupation 
for me and for Mr. Dean. During these hearings, Mr. Dean's role in the Watergate investigation became a subject of headline news almost daily. The Judiciary Committee's invitation to Mr. Dean to testify before it brought the question of executive privilege into critical focus. And I should insert there that also certainly did the President's statement issued on March 12th. A presidential press conference was scheduled for March 15, and Mr. Dean and I prepared for the President's briefing book a list of more than 20 possible questions on the subject. Although it was not, as I understand, the President's usual practice to hold face-to-face -face briefing sessions before a press conference, he, ch he chose to do so on this occasion. And so began a series of meetings about which Mr. Dean has testified and which marked the first occasion I had to discuss with the President any subject related to Watergate. The first meeting on March 14 was in progress when I was called to the President's office in the EOB. Messrs. Ziegler and Dean were already there. We went over the questions and answers with considerable discussion on each. The meeting recessed temporarily while the President kept another appointment and had lunch. It, re it reconvened after lunch for several hours. Mr. Chairman, at no time during this meeting or during the succeeding meetings on March 15, 19, and 20, 1973, all of which were attended only by the President, Mr. Dean, and myself, did anyone say anything in my presence which related to or suggested the existence of any cover-up or any knowledge or involvement by anyone in the White House, then or now, in the Watergate affair, including the cover-up. Late on the afternoon of March 15, after the President concluded his press conference, Mr. Dean and I were called to the Oval Office. We had a relaxed and informal session in which we discussed the press conference and the President's view of the doctrine of separation of powers. The topic to which the President devoted most attention and emphasis was the separation of powers. He made the point that the term executive privilege doesn't properly express the principle. He asked Mr. Dean and me to advise others who were dealing with the subject to use the term separation of powers. He emphasized several times that the President has the constitutional responsibility to preserve the separation of powers, a responsibility he cannot disregard. The President made the point that he cannot command any member of Congress to come to see him at the White House, but usually they come when invited, just as our people go up to the Hill when invited. He said our cabinet people seem to be up there testifying voluntarily practically every day. But the point is, he said, that one branch cannot, as a matter of right, command the other to appear. That, he said, would destroy the separation of powers. On March 19, I was called to meet with the President and Mr. Dean in the President's Executive Office Building office. The President reiterated his desire to get out a general statement in advance of the hearings. He asked us to be thinking about ways that this could be done. This would include or could include issuing a full statement or white paper. He was also interested in our thoughts about ways to present our stories to the Senate in terms of possible depositions, affidavits, or possible conferences or meetings which could give the Senate all the information it wished but which would not cut across the separation of powers. He asked Dean and me to consider ways to do this. Now, on late Late on March 19, 1973, or possibly on March 20, before we met later that day with the President, Mr. Dean told me that Howard Hunt was demanding that a large sum of money be given to him before his sentencing on March 23, and that he wanted the money by Wednesday the 21st. If the payments were not made, Dean said, Hunt had threatened to say things that would be very serious for the White House. I replied that this was pure blackmail, 
The dean should turn it off and have nothing to do with it. I could not imagine, I said, that anything that Hunt could say would be as bad as entering into a blackmail arrangement. I don't recall Mr. Dean's exact words, but he expressed agreement. This revelation was the culmination of several guarded comments, comments Mr. Dean had made to me in the immediately preceding days. He had said that he had been present at two meetings attended by Messrs. Mitchell, Magruder, and Liddy before the bugging arrests, during which Liddy had proposed wild schemes that had been turned down, specifically espionage, electronic surveillance, and even kidnapping. He said that the Watergate location had not been mentioned and that he had turned off the wild schemes. I believe then and believe today that Mr. Dean had no advanced knowledge of the Watergate bugging and break-in. In addition, he said that if he ever had to testify before the grand jury, his testimony would conflict with Mr. Magruder's and that he had heard that if Magruder faced a perjury charge, he would take others with him. Mr. Dean had also mentioned to me in these days in March that earlier activities of Messrs. Hunt and Liddy, not directly related to Watergate, could be seriously embarrassing to the administration if they ever came to light. He had also implied to me that he knew of payments being made to defendants for litigation expenses. And Hunt's explicit blackmail demand raised serious questions in my mind as to the purpose of these payments. This brings me to the afternoon of March 20, when Mr. Dean and I met with the President in the Oval Office. The meeting lasted about half an hour. The President again stated his hope that we could put out a full statement in advance of the hearings, and again he expressed his desire that we would be forthcoming, as he put it. He made some comparisons as to our attitude and the attitude of previous administrations, and he wanted us to make sure that we were the most forthcoming of all. As I sat through the meeting on March 20 with the President and Mr. Dean in the Oval Office, I came to the conclusion in my own mind that the President could not be aware of the things that Dean was worried about or had been hinting at to me, let alone Howard Hunt's blackmail demand. <laughs> Indeed, as the President talked about getting the whole story out, as he had done repeatedly in recent meetings, it seemed crystal clear to me that he knew of nothing that was inconsistent with the previously stated conclusion that the White House was uninvolved in the Watergate affair before or after the event. As we closed the door of the Oval Office and turned into the hall, I decided to raise the issue directly with Mr. Dean. I said that I had the feeling that the President had no knowledge of the things that were worrying Dean. I asked Dean whether he had ever told the President about them. Dean replied that he had not, and I asked whether anyone else had. Dean said he didn't think so. I said, and I use quotation marks to indicate the substance, and I think these are almost my precise words. I said, then the president isn't being served. He is reaching a point where he is going to have to make critical decisions, and he simply has to know all the facts. I think you should go in and tell him what you know. You will feel better. It will be right for him, and it will be good for the country. I do not recall whether Dean told me he would take action or not, but I certainly have the impression that he was receptive. In any event, the question was resolved that very evening when I received a call at home sometime after dinner, and it was Mr. Dean who said, the president just phoned him and that Dean had decided this was the moment to speak up. He said that he told the President that things had been going on that the President should know about, and it was important that Dean see him alone and tell him. Dean said that the President readily agreed and told Dean to come in the following morning. 
I congratulated Mr. Dean and wished him well. The next day, March 21, Mr. Dean told me that he had indeed met with the president at 10 o'clock and talked with him for two hours and had, in his words, let it all out. I said, did you tell him about the Howard Hunt business? Dean replied that he had told the president everything. I asked him if the president had been surprised, and he said yes. I say he said yes in terms of his response, whether it was he sure was, not yes as the exact word, but an affirmative statement. Following this critical meeting on March 21, I had several subsequent meetings and telephone conversations with Mr. Dean alone, as well as several meetings with the president, which Mr. Dean did not attend. I do not dispute Mr. Dean's account of the meetings between us as to any substantive point, and I have no direct knowledge of what transpired in Mr. Dean's subsequent meeting with the president, meetings with the president. But nothing said in my meetings or conversations with Mr. Dean or my meetings with the president it suggests in any way that before March 21, the president had known or that Mr. Dean believed he had known of any involvement of the White House, White House personnel in the bugging or the cover-up. Indeed, Mr. Dean's own account that he and I agreed on the importance of persuading the president to make a prompt disclosure of all that the president had just learned is hardly compatible with the belief on Mr. Dean's part that the president himself had known the critical facts all along. In one of my talks with the president, the president said he had kept asking himself whether there had been any sign or clue which should have led him to discover the true facts earlier. I told him that I wished I had been more skeptical and inquisitive so that I could have served the presidency better. I have given you the most complete account I can as to my knowledge of the events being examined by this committee. It is my deep conviction as one who has known the president over the years and has had many private conversations with him, that the critical facts about the Watergate did not reach the president until the, until the events that began when John Dean met with him on March 21, 1973. That completes my opening statement, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Sorry Lanzner, Assistant Counsel, will uh, ask questions uh, for the majority. Mr. Moore, I want to go back uh, briefly to uh, some dates prior to your testimony in your, from your statement. First, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, whether you had a meeting on February 10, 1972, uh, with uh, Mr. Kleindings and Mr. Mitchell at Mr. Mitchell's office at the Committee to Re-elect. Do you recall that meeting? I don't recall. You don't recall meeting with Mr. Mitchell or I, Mr. Kleindings? I don't recall any such meeting. It, it could well have happened. Though. Approximately 12.30 in the uh, midday. That, that's 72? Yes, 1972. Yes, sir. In Mr. Mitchell's office? At 1701 Pennsylvania Avenue, at the Committee to Re-elect offices. Do you have any recollection? No, I of that? don't. Uh, do you have a recollection of a meeting on March 14, 1972, uh, at 8:30 in the morning, also attended by Mr. Kleinings and Mr. Mitchell? What? what I'm sorry. Mr. That date was February 14, 1972. It would help if I knew when uh, 
domestic findings nomination was presented over in the Well, let me help, let me help you, Mr. Moore, because since you're, you're yes. don't have a specific recollection now, do you recall when Mr. Lackritz and myself interviewed you on June 7th at Mr. Miller's office? Do you recall our discussing this with you in Mr. Miller's office on June 7th? The, these two meetings? Yes, sir. I, I, I don't recall the conversation. Well, the results of our notes indicate that you said that uh, those meetings were related to Mr. Kleinitz's confirmation hearings. Oh, well, that, uh, they could well have been. That, that's why I asked about the dates of the... Uh, uh, Does that refresh your recollection as to what those uh, meetings were about? Yes, sir. Do you recall now, do you recall the meetings now? Well, I don't have independent recollection of the meetings, but if that was in the time frame of the hearings of the Judiciary Committee on Mr. Kleindienst's nomination, that's most likely uh, what they were about. Now, do you recall a meeting with Mr. Kleindienst, Mr. Mitchell, and Mr. Mardian uh, on March 10, 1972, beginning at approximately 10.30 a.m. in the morning? Not independently, but no, no sir. Do you recall telling us on June 7th that you did recall that meeting and that it referred to the upcoming Kleinings confirmation hearings? Well, I, I don't recall saying it that firmly. Obviously, that's what it could have been. And, uh, well, on June 7th, when Mr. Lackertz and myself interviewed you, do you, re do you recall telling us then that that meeting, you did remember that meeting and it referred to the Kleinings confirmation hearings? I, I don't think we're quite on the same frequency. And you say remembering the hearing. I remember that during the period of the Kleindienst dependency of the Kleindienst nomination, I met frequently with uh, Mr. Mitchell, sometimes Mr. Kleindienst, and others, uh, Mr. Mardigan, who was the Assistant Attorney General then, uh, to discuss the hearing and the steps that should be taken to help support the confirmation of the nomination of Mr. Kleindienst. But I don't know today that I was at a meeting on March 10, 72. Uh, I could check them, of course, but that, that's what the, these meetings would have been about. Well, Mr. Moore, let me ask you this. Uh, the, those hearings uh, involved the issue of it and Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, it, and uh, did you have any involvement uh, in the question of it and as it affected Mr. Kleinitz's uh, confirmation? Yes, I was a White House liaison or advisor uh, helping the department to support and present the case in favor of the confirmation of the uh, nomination of Mr. Kleindy. And you had some specific duties in assisting uh, in that effort? Well, I was a Johnny One note. I kept saying we should talk about the biggest victory and divestiture in the history of the antitrust laws that we achieved instead of all these details that were coming out uh, on television in the hall every day. And uh, I, I was an advisor to hit the main issue, yes. <laughs> I remember it vividly. And, uh, Do you have any recollection of receiving information concerning a, a White House investigation uh, relating to the it and matter? Receiving information or hearing conversations or seeing memoranda reflecting a White House investigation involving IT, the it and issue? A White House memorandum. A White House memoranda, memoranda, or uh, information concerning uh, um, the uh, White House involvement in an investigation. Are you refreshing your recollection, sir, from a, a document that your attorneys handed you? Yes. As you know, we did not review this particular area before Mr. Moore came in to testify today. That's correct. shortness of time, and I was merely letting him see a copy of the interview report to put in a frame of context the interviews that did, in fact, occur in my office approximately a month ago. And who prepared that uh, report, Mr. Miller? I assume the uh, committee did. Can you tell me? What? You, you said you tell, a, Mr. Miller, could you uh, tell us how you got a copy of that? Yes, it was handed to me in your presence in my office at about uh, quarter to seven last night. Okay. Uh, oh, no, that was, that was prepared, I believe, by Mr. Parker of the White House. Isn't that correct? I don't believe so. It was handed to me. I don't, I don't know. It was handed to me. By Mr. Thompson. By Mr. Thompson. I, I believe, the committee Mr. Thompson, that was a document, document prepared by the White House, by Mr. Parker of the White House, who was present at that interview. I have my own notes. I just haven't had the 
What's the date for that? June 8, 1993. June 8. That is a document that was sent over uh, by Mr. Doug Parker, who was also present at the interview. Interview of June 7. That, that's right. That's uh, right. That interview was not attended by anyone of the minority staff. Mr. Parker was over there. He submitted that uh, to me. I submitted it to you and to uh, Mr. Miller. Fine. Well, does that refresh your recollection as to what the yeah. White House investigation was conducted involving the IT and yeah. matter? If, if I may read it, sir. Mr. Lenzer. While Richard Moore takes a minute to refresh his memory, we're going to take a brief pause. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, Correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back, Assistant Chief Counsel Terry Linzer is still asking Richard Moore about his role in the ITT investigation. I'm having trouble finding the, well, the Mr. Moore, of a memorandum. You, let, me, let me first ask, uh, you have no independent recollection now of a, of a White House investigation involving IT&T. Is that correct? Without, without, and I'll then ask you a question, which I hope will refresh your recollection. Uh, 
Well, it's so general. You mentioned a memorandum, well, a White House memorandum. I, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, sure of, I'm speaking of, of any information you obtained involving a White House investigation uh, with regard to IT&T. Let me ask you this. Uh, did you meet with Mr. Colson during that period of time? Yes. Uh, and did you, have, did you have discussions with Mr. Colson uh, involving uh, the IT&T matter? Was this the, the it's not being difficult, I just can't recall. Was this the investigation where a young man uh, tried to prove that uh, Mr. Jack Anderson's secretary was a friend of Ms. Dita Beard? Is that the investigation? Yes, that's correct. Yes, I do remember that. And, you, I, this and was that an individual who was um, an employee of the Internal Security Division of the Department of Justice named John Martin? I could have been. I don't remember his name. And did you attend a meeting that he was present at when it, he was asked to conduct that investigation? Yes. And who else was present? Uh, I, blab, I, I can't recall exactly. Well, do you recall telling us on June 7th that it was a meeting in Mr. Ehrlichman's office with Mr. Colson, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Wally Johnson, yourself, and Mr. John Martin came in and was requested to interview people about a relationship between Dita Beard and Jack Anderson's secretary? That, that, that does it. You as, recall that now? My, yes. As you, my counsel said, I've been concentrating on other matters, and this has been – yeah, that sounds like – And do you, do you recall telling Mr. Lackerts and myself that on June 7th in Mr. Miller's office? You do – Well, do I, I don't recall it independently, but I don't quarrel with, with your report of it. Okay. Well, you'll accept my version. Sure. You don't, you don't remember yes. – No you, problem. You don't remember telling us that. Uh, you don't now remember I do now. I remember this discussion, Mr. Lenster, but I didn't remember what five names I mentioned. Do you, uh, I do. I accept that. That's, that's fine. Okay. Do you recall uh, whether you ever saw the results of that investigation in, in writing or heard them orally? I, can't, I recall hearing uh, a result, but whether it was oral or writing, I do not know. Do you I know who uh, – you don't recall whether it was in writing or, or who gave it to you – gave you information orally? Do you, sir, I'm no, sorry. No, I don't. Do you recall um, – if it was orally, who was the person who spoke to you? No, I don't recall. Now, do you recall that uh, you received information as to how the Dita Beard memoranda uh, was uh, furnished to Mr. Colson as part of your uh, participation in preparation for the IT&T hearings? I, th I think I might have said, and I don't remember, that, you know, the conversation that I learned. I have learned it in the newspapers that. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, memorandum went from the FBI to Justice to, to the White House, someone in the White House, I should say, uh, and then was given an independent examination by a commercial firm specializing in identifying typewriters. That's but do you, I, something like that, I do recall. Do you have any information on that besides what you read in the newspapers? information received directly from either White House or government employees? I simply don't remember. Uh, all right, Mr. Moore, let me – you don't recall that. Now, let me ask you this. On March 21st, 1972, you had a meeting with Mr. Mitchell, <coughs> Mr. Marty, and Mr. Jack Caulfield, and Mr. Dean at 2 o'clock. Do you recall that meeting? I recall you mentioning it, but I don't recall the meeting. I, I don't recall the purpose or substance of the meeting. I may have the date again. Uh, March 21st, sir. Of what year? 1972. That was a meeting in Mr. Mitchell's office. I remember saying to you that I didn't recall Mr. Caulfield being in the meeting, but uh, being in any meeting with Mr. Caulfield is what I, what I said, I think. That I remember he had the, at that time for a short period, had a little office adjoining Mr. Mitchell, and I remember him perhaps coming in the room once or twice when I'm about to be in there to deliver a piece of paper, but I don't remember him ever being in a meeting, but he could well have been. I don't remember it. Well, on June 7th, you told us that you were going to try to remember what was discussed on that date. Uh, have you had the opportunity to refresh your recollection, and do you recall now what the subject of that meeting was? I have not. I'm sorry. I didn't, I, don't, I didn't follow through on that. Now, you had a meeting with the President on June 30th, 1972. Uh, which, of course, was shortly after the uh, break-in of the Democratic National Committee. Do you recall 
the subjects discussed with, Mr. with uh, President Nixon on June 30th, 1972. Do you recall, the, first of all, do you recall meeting the President on June 30th, 1972? Uh, there's nothing about that date that uh, helps me out. Maybe, maybe I can look at the log. Well, uh, I think we gave your counsel yesterday a copy of the log sent over by the White House, uh, which does reflect, I believe, a meeting on June 30th. I just handed the log to him, Mr. <coughs> Does that uh, document which is furnished to us by the White House refresh your recollection, or is it conceivable it, uh, that you didn't meet with the President on that day? I've always found these logs reliable. I, uh, the log notes that uh, from 4.22 p.m. to 4.29 p.m., uh, the President met with Mr. Moore. Uh, more than a year ago. I, I noticed that, you know, in your office earlier today, and I couldn't recall what it, what it was, whether it was a, some ceremonial matter or whether, I just don't know. I can, I'm sure I can find a way to refresh my recollection on that. Well, I believe, uh, I, I'm not going to quarrel. I would say this, though, that uh, the fact that it happened to be in the same month as the Watergate uh, affair suggests nothing to me that refreshes my recollection. All right, well, um, I do believe that uh, when the, the log indicates on June 22 and June 27 that you met with the President then, but it, it involved, quote, broadcast executives. So I, I take it that that June 30th meeting was just between you and the President. Yes, that's what the log reflects. But do you recall whether you discussed the events of uh, June 17th and the Watergate break-in with the President on that day? I'm certain... Uh I'm sorry, Mr. Moore. I didn't hear your answer. Oh, but just a moment. I now, pardon me, the date comes back, of course. The, this was the day that Mr. John Mitchell had met with the President and they had reached a conclusion that uh, Mr. Mitchell was going to resign as chairman of the uh, campaign director. Uh, for reasons which are well known that Mrs. Mitchell had made this ultimatum. And uh, the President called me in to ask me a little bit as to, as to how the announcement should be made. And we spoke briefly about that. I was there seven minutes. Uh, you know, should the President make it? Should Mr. Mitchell make it? That kind of thing. Well, now, uh, you said in your, in your prepared statement, Mr. Moore, that your principal role was to assist the President in communicating their positions in, a most, in the most convincing manner to the general public. Now, it was clear on June 30th, was it not, that when Mr. Mitchell resigned from the campaign, uh, the press might imply that it was related directly or indirectly to the events of June 17th. Was that discussed? It really wasn't. Uh, uh, the well, were you working on that issue for the President at that time? No. Were you concerned about the, the that as an issue uh, and how the White House and the President were going to communicate, in your language, their positions in no. a convincing manner? No. Now, you met uh, on uh, August the 8th with Mr. Mitchell at 11 a.m. in the morning and at 11.20 in the morning, August 8, 1972. Uh, do you recall what the subject of that meeting was since you were the pres uh, Mr. Mitchell had left the uh, campaign at that time. Oh, that's the wrong uh, August 8, 1972. Yes, sir. And uh, what was the other date? The same date, and you met again at 11.20. It indicates two meetings on that date. I'm, I'm referring to Mr. Mitchell's diary. The logs that were, he's testified were kept uh, uh, by his uh, secretaries. Well, uh, no, I, I cannot. You have no recollection of that? You were on uh, Air Force One, apparently, on August 24, 1972, with the President. The White House log indicates a uh, trip 955 to 1120 to O'Hare Airport in Illinois and a 110 flight on Air Force One to 210 to Selfridge Air Force Base, Michigan, and a 335 to 555 flight to San Diego, California, all on August 24th. Did you discuss anything with the President 
uh, on that uh, occasion. Did you talk with the President in Air Force One? I'm trying to recall. No. You, 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 didn't see him, you didn't see him to talk to him at all on that day? Is that what you're saying? I didn't talk to him at all. Now, on September 5th, I, I, on uh, September 8th, 1972, you met with uh, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. LaRue, Mr. Miller, I take it that's Cliff Miller, Mr. Dean, Mr. Mardian, and Mr. Palmore at 6, 6 p.m. I'm sorry, 1 p.m. Do you recall what the subject of that discussion was? August. August. What was the date again? August, uh, I'm sorry, September 8, 1972. I better write these down because we, by the time the question finishes, I sometimes forget the date. Now, this, uh, this date is. Oh, yeah. You have no uh, recollection of that meeting, I take it. I, I haven't answered the question. Uh, I'm asking. Uh, September, the, those present, particularly Cliff Miller, and did you say Powell Moore was present yes, sir. also? Uh, that undoubtedly was the, perhaps the first, certainly one, of a series of meetings over a period of two or three weeks in the middle of, San, of September in this campaign year of 72, when, as I uh, perhaps had described, Mr. Stans and the Finance Committee to reelect were getting a particularly strong series of barrage of uh, criticisms every day on issues that uh, were coming up quite regularly, the checks, the lawsuits, uh, the, uh, the, that report that came out of the staff uh, of the Platinum Committee. Uh, the question of why, of why not disclose uh, fund pre April 7 funds voluntarily, that kind of thing. And uh, Mr. Stans, who is uh, his, either he nor his uh, finance committee, had any informational or press office. And uh, they felt they weren't getting enough attention or help from the committee for the re election of the president. So uh, it was decided, I think, or John Mitchell and Mr. Stans requested, asked me if I would join a little ad hoc committee to act as uh, public relations advisors to Mr. Stans and the Finance Committee uh, on these issues, which, of course, affected both committees. This was the campaign, an attack on our fundraising practice was an attack on the general committee. So I attended quite a number, I would say six, eight, or ten meetings over a two or three week period. The, the, the Public Relations Committee was uh, <coughs> uh, Cliff Miller, who was a professional in that field, Powell Moore, who has a very fine record in that field in the government, and uh, myself, and that, that would have been it. And your recollection now is that the meetings, uh, those meetings were concerning the uh, subject matter that you've just described. Is yes, that, that is correct. Now, on, not, on September 13, 1972, you met at 2 p.m. with Mr. Stans, Mr. Parkinson, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. LaRue, Mr. McPhee, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Miller, and Mr. Mitchell. Uh, was there any discussions on that day about uh, Mr. McPhee's relationships with Judge Ritchie, to your recollection? Uh, I recollect none. Not that there were any. I'm sorry, Mr. I can't hear you. I support. recollect not. And uh, is it possible that there were that you don't recall I, right I, now? I doubt that very much. Had you heard of that subject discussed at any time? No. Now, that was two days before the indictment on September 15, 1972. Was the impending indictment discussed in that meeting? Uh, no. I don't know that we – well, no. I want to turn now 
I think it's fair to say, too, uh, and I want to know, Mr. Moore, if you agree with this, that when we did discuss some of these meetings that are reflected in Mr. Mitchell's diary on June 7th of this year, that you had a similar problem recollecting what the subject matter of those discussions were. Is that an accurate statement? When we initially went over these meetings? Uh, which meetings are you referring well, to? Well, the meetings that I just asked you about. Well, I responded to quite a few. Well, I, well, uh, and I, I take it that the one, you, that the series, uh, I mentioned there was a series of meetings, for example, dealing with Mr. Kleindienst's nomination, and that when, during this period, I met with Mr. Kleindienst and Mr. Mitchell and others, that, of course, we were dealing with the subject of his nomination and confirmation. I have outlined a series of problems at the Finance Committee, and given the dates and then the, and the makeup of the subcommittee, and I've told you that those meetings dealt with those subjects. I think we could probably find a headline or a statement that came out every day that was one of those meetings. By the way, were you uh, also uh, assisting in the preparation of the Committee to Re-Elect's press releases and uh, statements in response to the news that was coming out of the newspapers? Uh, rarely. Were you consulted on the denials that were being issued uh, uh, by Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Porter, and Mr. Magruder, uh, involving their, uh, reflecting their non-involvement with, uh, with the uh, break-in on June 17th? No. Now, in your statement uh, today, you say that you were primarily involved uh, with inaugural matters in December 1971 and January 1973, and can recall no direct meeting or consultations with regard to the Watergate or related matters until February 6th. I take it that's February 6th of this year. Is that correct? Is that my understanding? That yes, sir. Now, would you include as a related matter the information that uh, became public on the on the, the issue of the White House relationship to Donald Segretti? Uh, Mr. Lenzner, if I could find the page. That's page four, uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, I, uh, you know what, I corrected the years. I uh, had made two other corrections which, in, in reading it, I uh, failed to include in my reading. I, my, my reading copy has the word insert in latter December. I meant to read that. In uh, latter December. In latter December. And then uh, in the second line it says, recall no particular meetings or consultations. With regard to Watergate or related matters? Right. Now, did you consider the Segretti matter a related matter? Actually not. Although, well, what did you, what at did that you... time, but for the purpose of this hearing, I certainly am willing to acknowledge that the, this hearing, which is known as the Watergate hearing or the Urban hearing, embraces matters that would involve the Segretti matter. But I, I was not being cute about words. Uh, I did recall in early December we did have discussions about Segretti, and that's why I caught that error but failed to read it. And if I may, I'd like to uh, correct the record Fine, to reflect Thank what I've written on my statement. Now, let me ask you this, though. Before December of 1972, were you not deeply involved in the Segretti matter on behalf of the White House? What I was involved in was a response to a news report that connected Dwight Chapin uh, to Mr. Segretti in terms and in a frame of reference which we thought at the time were inaccurate. That was not, I would say, being deeply involved in the well, Segretti I, matter. I didn't mean you personally were involved in his activities, but were you involved in the White House's response to the information that was coming out about his activities? Uh, yes. And in fact, uh, were you not requested to conduct an investigation of, uh, of the White House involvement and prepare a statement on that uh, subject. Yes. And to that end, did you interview a variety of employees of the White House? I interviewed, uh, interviewed two uh, employees. And who was that? Mr. Chapin and Mr. Strahan. Yeah, did you talk to any? Who asked you, by the way, to conduct that investigation and prepare that statement? Mr. Ehrlichman. And you recall when he asked you to do that? Yes. Uh, he recall, I recall that uh, I think on 
uh, the weekend, it was the St. Patrick's Day weekend, I think, February 16th, late in the day, he called me and said he had just left the president, who still was insisting that everything that anybody knew should be gotten out, and would I take a crack at a outline or a preliminary uh, report on the connect the White House connection with Mr. Segretti, so that we could see what it looked like, and uh, uh, I think I that that was probably dated March 22nd, if I'm not mistaken, but that. Of 1973. Yeah, 73. But did you not have discussions in October of 1972 concerning yes. Segretti? Yes. But who, who were those discussions with? Well, the first discussion uh, were with uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Ziegler, and I think Chapin, and myself. How about Mr. Dean? No. All right. Now, on June 7th, June 7th, and I don't want to quarrel with your memory, Mr. Moore, but on June 7th, you told Mr. Lackritz and myself that at that meeting, it was attended by John Ehrlichman, Ziegler, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Dean, and yourself. You issued a brief statement, and you did not recall specifically Mr. Chapin attended the meeting, but said that he probably, later you said in the interview, he probably was there since he had the most information. Now, does that refresh uh, your recollection that... Uh, yes, it does, and uh, I think Chapin probably was there. I was wrong about Dean. It turns out he was getting married at that moment, and uh, he was not there. Mr. Dean was not there. He was invited, but he was. Uh, uh, and I take it that uh, you've you've had your memory refreshed by Mr. Dean's appearance before this committee. Is that how you know that now? Yes. I, I, when he talked about his honeymoon, I suddenly remembered that was the, the that was the very weekend when this Washington Post story was about to break. And after that, uh, did you? Uh, uh, receive information from Mr. Chapin and Mr. Strawn uh, involving uh, their uh, relationships with Mr. Segretti. Yes. yes. And did you incorporate some of that information into what is now Exhibit 40 that has been submitted uh, to this committee by Mr. Dean? Is that your memoranda? memorandum? This was a draft that I prepared as a starting point for a, uh, a report uh, that Mr. Dean might make, or it could be. Uh, it, it was in response to the, the uh, uh, request I just told you about from Mr. Ehrlich. All right. Now, by the way, let me just ask you this. Uh, uh, do you, did you ever discuss the events of June 17th with the President uh, prior to the time that you learned of Mr. Dean's knowledge uh, concerning those in March of 73? The uh, no, so I better have that question read back. Well, did you did you ever discuss with President Nixon the events of June 17th prior to, um, say, January 1 of 1973? No. Now, turning to the uh, La Costa meeting in February of 1973. Do you recall um, whether Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman, first of all, did you take any notes at that meeting? No, I did not. Was a memoranda ever uh, uh, written up by anybody on that meeting reflecting the agenda or the items discussed? Uh, the only memoranda that I'm aware of were those that Mr. Dean presented, an agenda, none of which I ever saw before until showed him on television. Well, do you know, did Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman take notes, or did they take those conversations, to your knowledge? I don't know either. Now, did Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman furnish any facts of their own uh, when you were discussing the Watergate matter and how they would, uh, how they would uh, respond to Senator Irvin's committee? Uh, facts? Facts of their own personal knowledge concerning the uh, breaking and entering on June 17th? No. Do you recall whether there was any discussion of the uh, Watergate criminal case uh, in, at the La Costa meeting? Uh, I do not. Do you recall if there was any discussion of the Democratic National Committee civil suit at that meeting? I have to answer it this way. I do not recall the suits by names. It's possible. I do not recall specifically. Well, I did you. Did you recall any discussion of the suit brought by Common Cause 
out of that meeting. Mr. Lindsay, uh, Mr. Dean was talking about the cases, and uh, I don't have a firm recollection, but uh, that common, the common cause suit was, this was mentioned. Um, I do not have a firm recollection about You say it. the common cause suit was mentioned, sir? I, I do not have a firm recollection that right. it was. And I remind you that we asked you this yeah. question yeah. with Mr. Thompson and Mr. Moore. Mr. Thompson may not have been present, but Mr. Moore was there. Today, at approximately 1 o'clock in Mr. Thompson's office, I asked you uh, if there was any discussion in Lacoste of the De Democratic National Committee lawsuit, the Common Cause lawsuit, and you said no, there was not, to your recollection. Now you say that there may have been. Uh, well, I, uh, I'll let my answer stand, whatever it was. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, <laughs> what I'm asking you now is you recall at approximately 1 o'clock today, saying that you that there was no discussion of the common cause suit or the democratic national committee suit or for that matter the watergate criminal trial i think we have a little of the uh, first speaker and listener not understanding each other uh, the suits were discussed i think the point this afternoon was that i found it difficult to specify which suit had been identified in that conversation by name and i think i was asked in that frame of reference uh, and, uh, uh, but the, the, the pending lawsuits, and there was a general uh, discussion of the, or a report really, of various lawsuits, and it was not part of my field of interest, and I don't, I was, as, as I think you said uh, this afternoon, you sounds like you weren't paying too much attention, and you were right. Uh, so you're t you were not paying much attention that, in that, that's right. that discussion. Well, do you recall uh, who first suggested uh, that you asked Mr. Mitchell to raise funds. Again, as I think we had talked about today, either, either uh, Ehrlichman or Haldeman. Uh, I think today when I asked you that at 1 o'clock, you said, yeah. can I see my statement? Uh, no, that, I didn't. You didn't, you didn't no. ask to see your statement at that point? No. I, uh, you don't remember asking Mr. Miller to let your one of the well, lawyers there to probably about whether I asked to see my statement or not. Mr. I believe that Mr. Miller showed it to me and you objected. I didn't ask for it. No, I, you, I, uh, I asked you if you had any re recollection I, before you uh, looked at your statement of whether you uh, remembered who suggested raising, uh, getting Mr. Mitchell to raise right. the funds. And at that point, uh, you, you said you didn't. You didn't recall whether it was Mr. Holdeman or Mr. Ehrlich. That is right. And that, uh, now, and as I said, that's not an infrequent situation to be placed in because I uh, trying now, to remember which it was is often a problem. At page seven of your uh, of your uh, statement, you indicated that Mr. Ehrlich made it clear that the president wanted uh, uh, the position of the White House to be one of full cooperation, subject only to the doctrine of separation of powers. Uh, did you ever uh, talk with the president and have him indicate to you that he wanted Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and Mr. Dean to come up before Senator Irvin's committee and testify? This is up till the present date. At any time. No. Uh, uh, you, did you ever become aware of the fact that? Perhaps would you read that? Can I have that question read yes. back? Did you, Did you ever hear from President Nixon that he wanted Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and Mr. Dean to come up to Senator Urban's committee and testify before his committee? No. Did you ever become aware of whether that was in fact the president's position, or did it become? the President's position at any time, to your knowledge, before, I might say, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman, and Mr. Dean left the White House? Uh, no. Now, have you had an opportunity to, re to review the log that was submitted of Mr. Dean's meetings and calls with the President that was prepared by the White House? I have not reviewed it. 
Well, let me read you from the entry of March 17th, which says, in part, the President wanted Haldeman, this reflects, allegedly reflects, a meeting between the President and Mr. Dean. The President wanted Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Dean to talk to the committee, and Dean resisted. Now, to your knowledge, is that an accurate statement from conversations you've had with the President? Well, that conversation was not in my presence. Well, I'm asking you now. I can't say whether it was accurate or not. You don't know for whether he did or did not want, at any time, those three individuals to come up before Senator Irvin's committee. Well, again, uh, if you're, are you speaking in a formal appearance uh, as a witness or to appear before the committee informally and answer all questions? Well, the law does not make a, uh, a distinction on that, Mr. Moore, but I think, uh, uh, I think it, must, uh, it might indicate uh, testimony before this committee, which was the subject of the question of executive privilege, was it not? Well, um, but I was not in the discussions or negotiations with the committee, but it was my understanding from perhaps the press or among, uh, in general that the president wanted his people to cooperate in every way they could except under a command appearance, as I discussed in my testimony. So that could have included an appearance other than a formal appearance before a hearing. Now, you also... Uh said in your statement that uh, uh, you have no recollection, absolutely no recollection, of the conversation which Mr. Dean testified about concerning the time when you left the meeting with him, which, which he alleges you left uh, out of La Costa. That is right. Um, are you absolutely sure, beyond any doubt now, that you did not leave that meeting with Mr. Dean? No, I'm not sure that I did or that I didn't. And are you absolutely sure, beyond any doubt, that you did not have that conversation with not, Mr. Dean? Uh, a, I don't think I had any conversation. B, I certainly didn't have the conversation uh, he described. Well, uh, if we walked out together, and I don't know if we did, and he said it's stopped raining, maybe we had a conversation. We did not have the conversation that... Well, as you, said, as you said yourself, Mr. Moore, you did not realize the significance of the request to Mr. Mitchell to raise funds. That is right. So is it possible that you did not also realize the significance of what Mr. Dean was trying to say to you after you left that meeting? Well, whatever it was he said, if he said anything, and if there was a conversation, and if there was, I certainly did not get anything remotely resembling the uh, meaning that seems to be conveyed in the words he used in his testimony, uh, if it happened, which I don't, but the conversation, as I say, did not take place, but if there were remarks passed as we, as we left, it had no resemblance to that. And there's no question in your mind that that conversation didn't take place? Is that correct? Is Absolutely. That you, now, you also testified on, you stated on page 13 that uh, at no time during meetings of four, the March 14th, 15th, 19th, or 20th, uh, with President, Mr. Dean, and yourself, did anyone say anything involving Watergate involvement or cover-up? Uh, are you aware, Mr. — first, you, you watched Mr. Dean's testimony, did you not? Not all of it. Well, are you aware of the fact that Mr. Dean did not testify that any discussions were held at those meetings concerning the matters that you've outlined here? This does not, in other words, con conflict in any shape or form with what Mr. Dean testified to. Are you aware of that? I don't think I am aware of that. I think he twice testified that he said some of these things at a meeting with the president at which I was present. Not, not, on, not, on, any, uh, not on any dates on March 14th, 15th, 19th, or 20th. Oh, he, no, that's true. He, uh, he said it twice, I believe, that he had said it in the presence of the president and me, but in, the, in one of the two times he said it, he said, I cannot place the date. And there's a perfectly good reason he can't place the date, because it didn't happen. Well, I don't, I'm not going to review the testimony of each of those occasions with Mr. Sure Dean. His testimony was stand for itself. Um, by the way, uh, you are aware now, are you not, that they discussed uh, uh, Mr. Dean and Mr. and President Nixon discussed uh, possible uh, involvement of a variety of individuals on March 13th in the president's office. 
Are you aware of that? You mean, am I aware of, of the dean testifying to that? No, I'm, I'm asking you if you're aware of the fact that the, the White House itself has admitted that there was a discussion between Mr. Dean and the president about whether Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Colson knew of Watergate. Uh, Mr. Strawn was involved in the discussion. Um, and there was a question whether Colson or Holdeman knew Segretti. You, are you aware of that discussion as admitted by the White House? Well, when you say the discussion, am I aware of that report? Yes, sir. Oh. You're not? Uh, no, I'm not. Was that published in the New York Times? I tried to read the New York Times. Well, the papers have been publishing a lot of things. I don't know. I, I uh, don't keep, can't keep up with myself, Mr. Ward. But, uh, <laughs> now, You also testified, uh, Mr. Moore, that you were told, I'm sorry, you, yes, you testified, Mr. Moore, that you stated that uh, Mr. Dean told you that Howard Hunt was, I think in your words, uh, trying to uh, blackmail uh, people for money. Now, did you ask uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Dean on that occasion uh, what was behind that? Did you try to get details of uh, what that involved? Uh, no. You did, you, this is the first time you heard about blackmail, is it not? By Mr. Hunt? Yes. Had you heard previously to that meeting that uh, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Liddy, had, from Mr. Dean, had been involved in earlier activities that could be seriously embarrassing to the administration? Yes. And uh, when was that for the first time? I can't quite place it. It was in, in this growing uh, or accelerating period in mid-March as Mr. Dean was coming under more and more daily pressure where he talked to me more than he had been doing. And he, at one point, he said, what I testified to about these activities. Well, what uh, activities was he talking about? I don't know. You never asked him what specific activities no. might be embarrassing to the administration? No. When did you first learn of the, L the break in of Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist? Uh, Mr. I, can, I, can, I can't give you that date. I don't know the exact date. Uh, was it sometime in March of 1973? No. Uh, no, it would have been later than that. Well, was it, uh, you don't have any recollection of when that date was? That was rather significant information, was it not? Yes, and I, I, uh, there's an awful lot of significant information coming out between. Well, did Mr. Dean. Days and it's for fixing the date. I can do a little checking on that and see if I can did find Mr. anything that would remind me of the date. Did Mr. Dean tell you who was involved in, uh, in that break-in whenever you heard about it? I don't recall that he did. I, uh, I will... Uh, well, at one point he did, didn't he? Didn't you once review with him a list of people who might be indicted who were employed at the White House? Yes. And what, when was that? I believe it was either April 13th or April 14th, 1973. And uh, did he indicate to you that Mr. Holt, Mr. Ehrlichman might be indicted? Yes. And did he indicate why? Uh, he said he might have trouble Oh, was that $350,000? No, that was Mr. Haldeman, I think. Mr. Oh, you just said Mr. Haldeman. No, Mr. Ehrlichman. Uh, uh, I asked, I, 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 as I recited to you earlier today, when I saw the list, I pointed to Ehrlichman and I said, uh, what's he got to do with Watergate? Uh, you know, what, what's right. this? And he said his problem may be with Ellsberg. Now, Well, did he say anything else? I think I told you today that, that I cannot recall whether at that time 
having now learned about the break-in and having heard about it, whether uh, Ellsberg was synonymous with the break-in or whether I would now attach that to it. Well, did you I, I've been puzzled by that and I've acknowledged that I don't recall whether uh, Mr. Dean was often cryptic and guarded and his, his answer to the best of my recollection was uh, his Ehrlichman's trouble may not, may be, uh, may be Ellsberg, not Watergate. Well, but the trial of that case was, was on at that time. Did you ask, I believe it was, did you ask him uh, what Ehrlichman's relationship to, the, uh, to Ellsberg was? He surely wasn't on trial with him. Uh, what, was the, what was the relationship? I don't know. He, he, uh, as I say, it's possible that he, that he mentioned, but I, I cannot pin that down. Did you? And this would have been, would have been April 14th. Um, well, did you ask him any questions on that subject of Ehrlichman's relationship no, to Ellsberg? No, I was, uh, no. Did you tell anybody that, uh, about that matter? Did you tell the President about it? The possibility of Mr. Ehrlichman's involvement with Mr. with uh, Ellsberg, which was rather vague, obviously, in your mind. Yes. You did tell the President. When did you tell the President? On August 19th, pardon me, April 19th. About five days after you first learned of it. Is that correct? I think it was that soon, yes. And what did you tell the president? And who else was present? I was the only one with the president, and it was two days after his April 17th statement, and we had a discussion about it. We, we had a conversation. That's what it was. Well, did you, uh, you don't recall, would you recall what specifically you said about Mr. Ehrlichman's involvement with the Ellsberg case? Yes. Uh, well, you say specifically. It, it, well, to the best I, of your I, recollection, I'm, I'm trying to recall, and, and I want to be careful about it in the circumstances. I told him that Mr. Dean had shown me this list, and uh, I recalled the names from memory. I, I didn't cover them all. I mentioned the names that I remembered. And... Uh, uh, I simply said that, that I, I didn't understand it uh, or, or I didn't understand uh, how, how, how uh, realistic it was and uh, in, in discussing the names I said that Dean had told me that apparently in his opinion uh, the that Mr. Ehrlichman's problem might not be, be involved with the Ellsberg case or whether by then I knew about the Ellsberg break-in, I don't know. I don't think I said break-in. I think I said with Ellsberg or the Ellsberg. Well, what was the President's reaction to that? Did he, what, what did he say to you at that time? He said that, of course, investigation of Ellsberg had to be done because Mr. Hoover could not be counted on doing it because Mr. Hoover was a close friend of Mr. Ellsberg's father, father-in-law. Father-in-law, yes, sir. And go ahead. What else did he say? That's all he said. Well, what was that? What relationship did that have with Mr. Ehrlichman's involvement with Mr. Ellsberg? Did he tell you that Mr. Ehrlichman had an investigation conducted uh, by this uh, so-called plumbers group because Mr. Hoover could not be relied, relied upon himself? Uh, I'm not a, I was not a student of the Ellsberg case, and I don't remember the dates or the procedures. I, the question was that, the point was that the White House had set up a security operation to investigate Mr. Ellsberg's activities in leaking top secret documents, and possibly giving them to a foreign embassy of the other great superpower. And that the President said, in view of the fact that Mr. Hoover uh, would not undertake this investigation. The White House undertook it. 
and he didn't I think uh, that was about all he said. Did he say that he knew that there had been a break-in of Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist? No, he did not. Was it your impression that he did know? I uh, long since learned not to try to draw impressions uh, from the president in that fashion. He didn't say anything about it. Now, are you aware of the fact that during Mr. Richardson's confirmation hearings on May 22nd in, relation, in, re in response to a question from Senator Byrd, President, Mr. Richardson said that the president he had spoken on Sunday, April 25, and the president had told him he had found out about the break-in on April 25. Were you aware of that uh, no. testimony? Uh, I have no more questions at this time, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee will stand, I mean, the committee will stand in recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow. With the appearance of special White House counsel Richard Moore, the hearings have entered a cooler phase. Barring a real surprise, there's not much that Moore can say that will greatly influence the committee. Moore is not a witness who's facing criminal indictment, and he's still employed in the White House, a fact which gives him a very different perspective from that of many other witnesses. Moore is a successful broadcast executive and a media advisor to the president, but he doesn't seem at all like the super bureaucrats who've previously testified. For one thing, you can't remember the difference between Ehrlichman and Haldeman. We're left to speculate how Moore, who reportedly advises the president on how to appear to the media, especially television, thinks he did today. Was he aware that his lapses of memory would become painfully obvious? And if he was, what kind of an impression does he think he's making on the American people? Robin, obviously, tonight's late news is making an impression not only on the American people, but on the Watergate Committee and investigators. The report that President Nixon will be confined to Bethesda Naval Medical Center for a week will slow all his activities, although Presidential Press Secretary Ron Ziegler says he will be able to carry on necessary work while resting and recuperating. This means, obviously, that the meeting set up today with Senator Sam Irvin will be delayed. The president complained early Thursday morning of chest pains and has been running a temperature of fever of between 101 and 102 degrees all day. He was given an electrocardiogram, and Ziegler reports the results were perfectly normal. This is the first major illness in office for the 60-year-old president, and it comes at a point midway through the first phase of the Watergate hearings. Jim? Quite obviously, there were two witnesses today, and that means two sets of impressions of the two men and their performances. Well, John Kramer of the Georgetown University Law Center here in Washington and Stephen Hess, a former White House assistant, now a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, watched the proceedings with us today, and I want to ask them what their impressions were. Mr. Hess? Well, we saw two men, both the same age, 59 years old. Mr. Mitchell's recollections were often faulty, and Mr. Moore's memory was atrocious. Yet one suspects that an American jury would have liked Mr. Moore. He appeared very befuddled at times. Still, he was sincere and grandfatherly. Perhaps there is something that we feel almost viscerally about Mr. Moore and about his memory that reminds us that perhaps our memories might have failed us in the way that his failed him. On the other hand, we can't feel quite so certain about Mr. Mitchell and his memory. For one thing, Mr. Mitchell has been put in the position of a defendant, and Mr. Moore has not. Then, too, there's been the question of style or attitude. Mr. Mitchell appears sardonic and biting, while Mr. Moore has only been embarrassed and confused and sometimes plaintive. The key, I think, to Mr. Mitchell's testimony was summed up by Sam Dash when he said, if we are to believe Mr. Mitchell, then we have to dis disbelieve all or part of the testimonies of Magruder, McCord, Reasoner, Sloan, Dean, and Stans. Mr. Moore's prepared statement was very important. He said that on March 20th, Dean told him that he, Dean, had not told the president about the Watergate cover-up, nor had anyone else. And this, of course, is in sharp contradiction to Mr. Dean's testimony that he had felt that the president knew of the cover-up from meetings of September 15th, 1972 and March 13th, 1973. But Mr. Moore's responses to cross-examination did not give us a very great feeling of confidence in his prepared statement. Mr. Kramer, you want to add or subtract anything from that? Yeah, I think I, I would really sort of add and supplement by saying really what you had, I think, tonight was Santa Claus and the Squid. Uh, 
<laughs> Santa Claus looking very jolly with his nice white hair, but actually giving no gifts. He was an Indian giver. I think his major contribution in his direct statement was to say that he felt after he met with the president on the 21st that the president didn't know anything before the 21st of March and that he got that impression from him. The very last thing, or almost the very last thing he said, came out of nowhere, totally unrelated to what he had said before, was, and I quote him exactly, I have long since learned not to try to draw impressions from the president like that. He was referring to another meeting with the president. So that Santa Claus canceled himself That had out. to do with the, uh, whether the president knew of the Ellsberg psychiatrist break-in. Exactly. Right. So that he just absolutely, as far as I can tell, canceled himself. Santa Claus gave a gift, retrieved it. The squid kept squirting ink and moving away and squirting more and more ink until finally Mr. Dash took his harpoon and took a swipe at him. And I think perhaps, or certainly I think from the viewing public's point of view, successfully impaled him. I think Mr. Mitchell comes out of this very much a beaten man in the public eye, although he had tried desperately for two and a half days to, uh, to try to not, not let them know really what the situation was. And I think he comes out looking, at least in several instances, as being a prevaricator, not simply someone who, in his words, was not trying to volunteer information. He was trying to volunteer misinformation. And I think that image comes out. Do you agree with that? Well, let me put into perspective what I think was important about Moore's prepared statement. It was not what he thought the president said, because after all, that is just hearsay or supposition. But it is what he reports the dean said to him. And I think that was the part that was truly damaging to Dean, who kept talking about Mr. Moore as almost his father confessor. Yeah, and the conflicts on the Lacosta meeting uh, as to what uh, Dean said when they walked out, and, uh, and the testimony of Dean, of course, was that he warned Moore about not getting involved in anything like this, of carrying a message uh, uh, to Mitchell. Of course, uh, the, uh, what do you think about the, uh, getting back to Mr. Moore for a minute, Mr. Kramer, what effect do you think the, the bad memory or the confusion that Mr. Moore had later on on the questions that involving seemed almost irrelevant at the time they involved ITT. Well, what effect do you think that has on his earlier statements? Well, I think that's the, this is the classic problem that a jury confronts. I think Mr. Hess started to draw it out, which is that the man is very sympathetic. He's a lovely man. You want to believe him. But as it goes on and you realize that for most, in fact, as, with respect to something that had happened at 1 o'clock this afternoon, he seemed mm -hmm. to have forgotten by 4.15. There is real trouble in his exact memory of events four months ago. So that I think he really totally undercut himself by the time the day was over. Let's go back to John Mitchell for a minute. Uh, both of you have, uh, if I could characterize uh, what you have said, you've put him down, you know, in terms of his testimony. You've uh, indicated very clearly, in fact, Mr. Kramer, that you think that he came off as, uh, in the public's mind at least, as a liar. Uh, would uh, either one of, can either one of you think of anything nice to say at this stage of the game about uh, Mr. Mitchell's performance over a three-day period? Mr. Hess? Well, I don't think he's going to go to jail on the basis of it. At least to Mr. Mitchell, that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. he, does, he came across uh, as uh, a person who uh, has been shown to, to contradict himself, uh, but there hasn't been anything that he has said that can be used against him in terms, I think, of obstructing justice or, or being actively involved in, in this cover-up. Then you would not agree that his manner, his demeanor, uh, except on some specifics, but his demeanor now uh, was one of candidness, that you didn't, he didn't project that when he would answer questions? Oh, no, there's no question. I, in my mind, at least, he did not strike me as a sympathetic or particularly candid witness. He was playing the same strategy that he had reported uh, earlier in the summer uh, uh, of 1972. He was not going to volunteer anything if he didn't have to. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. I asked Mr. Hess a moment ago whether he agreed. Now I ask you whether you agree. One man who would vehemently disagree with our guest is Mitchell's attorney, William Hundley. He says that his client's reticence is justified because every word he says might be used against him in later legal action. During a break today, Hundley told Peter Kay how he thinks his client did as a witness. Well, I think he's done very well. He's answered all the questions truthfully and candidly. And uh, if it were a trial, I, am, I doubt if the case would even get to the jury. But if it did, I'm sure we'd be acquitted. 
Well, I wouldn't have expected you to, to say anything very different. Do you think? Uh, do you think your client's position? You indicated this before has been jeopardized by this line of questioning. That it's been unfair to his constitutional rights as a defendant in another case, and possibly as one and still another one. No, no question about it. I mean, he's. Uh uh, there's a proceeding up in New York. He's been advised that he's a target down here. They've gone over precisely the same ground that could well be the subject of a criminal charge. He has the same right as any other American citizen in these circumstances to just wait until and see if the government can prove those charges. Now, then and only then does he have uh, any responsibility to come forward with his own defense. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the prosecutors will uh, have available to them uh, with great, uh, with, with fatal prejudice, prejudice to him, his entire defense. And I think that is, is such a valid legal proposition uh, uh, that it will prevail. Whether the Mitchell testimony is credible is one matter, and the committee will have to resolve it, as he invited them to when his version is put up against all the former and subsequent witnesses. But one effect of his testimony may cause some difficulties in the White House. By implication, Mr. Mitchell seriously undermined the edifice Mr. Nixon built to justify his behavior in his statement of May 22nd. In that lengthy document, Mr. Nixon was at pains to suggest that he may have contributed to the cover-up by not wishing to have some White House activities come to light. It was made under oath, that is correct. Now, Mr. Mitchell, uh, you've told, uh, you've testified several times to the committee as to the circumstances, un circumstances under which Mr. Liddy was hired as counsel uh, to the committee for the re-election of the president, involving Mr. Dean's introduction, your interview with him on November 24th, and your hiring of Mr. Liddy. Is that not correct? Well, I think my testimony and my recollection is how it happened that after Mr. Dean had brought Mr. Liddy over to meet with me, 
on November 24, 1971, and discuss the areas in which he would be working. Uh, we met, that is, Liddy, Dean, and myself, we discussed it, and then, as I understand it, that the suggestion was that since Mr. Magruder was then overrunning the committee, that Mr. Liddy be put in touch with Mr. Dean, or Mr. Magruder, by Mr. Dean, and that the hiring would, took place over there. Well, but you were aware of the circumstances on, under which he, he was hired. I was aware of the circumstances of Mr. Dean having brought Mr. Liddy over to meet with me, and I having said that it looked to me like he could be perfectly competent as counsel. And you approved his being hired? Counseled for that committee. Right. And Mr. Magruder hired him on your approval. Is that not true? I would presume that that had All followed. Right. Now, have you ever denied to anybody that you were aware of the circumstances of Mr. Liddy's employment with the committee? There was one occasion in which my recollection failed with respect to who actually hired Mr. Liddy. It is still my opinion that Mr. Magruder hired Liddy and not John Mitchell. Well, without to the question of who actually hired him, the circumstances under, under which uh, he, uh, he became employed, uh, which would include at least your interviewing of him and your having some role. I mean, uh, have you ever denied ha ha knowing any of those circumstances? I don't recall, Mr. Dash. Right. Under the same testimony, Mr. Mitchell, on September 5, uh, 1972, the question was put to you on page 18 of the uh, transcript. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, do you have any information as to the circumstances under which Mr. Liddy was hired? Reference to the Committee for the Re-election of the President. Mr. Answer, no, sir, I have, do not. Question, have you ever made inquiry to find out how it came that he was hired? Answer, have I made inquiry? Question, yes. Answer, no, I have not. Now, that testimony was under oath. Could you have actually been able to answer no to that question? When very, very easily, because I was not aware of how Mr. Magruder ultimately hired Mr. Liddy. Well, the question really wasn't that, was it, Mr. Mitchell? In the context that you have read it, and as I understood it at that particular time, the answer was yes. It was asked, do you have any information as to the circumstances under which Mr. Liddy was hired. And wouldn't a truthful answer to that be that I may not have hired him myself, or it may have been Mr. Magruder, but I interviewed him, uh, that um, Mr. Dean brought him over, I approved him. Now, maybe I didn't hire him, but maybe Mr. Magruder did. Wouldn't that be a truthful answer rather than, no, sir, I do not have any information? It gets to a point of degree, Mr. Dash, and the question as to the hiring, and the hiring was done by Mr. Magruder, in the following month, and I had no knowledge of those aspects of well, Mr. Do you remember Magruder this, hiring them. Do you remember, did you remember that time, the um, interview uh, of uh, Mr. Dean, when you no, were asked I, that question? I, I had no recollection of the interview at that time. And you had no recollection of your approving uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Liddy at that time? Well, you're using the word approving. It wasn't to that extent. It was the basis of a conversation that, yes, I think he'd be perfectly all right Mr. For Mitchell, your counsel for the committee, and the ultimate decision was to be made by McGregor. Yeah, but Mr. Mitchell, you know that an agenda was prepared for that interview, and that if you didn't approve Mr. Liddy, Mr. McGregor never would have hired him. You know that. That could very well be the case, or it well, might have been otherwise, because and therefore Mr. You did have might have gone to other people and got the consent for the approval. But at least you had information of some of the circumstances. That I did, that I did have information of that meeting at that particular well, time. It probably was not within my recollection. We didn't yeah. have the agenda. Uh, show. Wouldn't, uh, isn't, isn't it so, Mr. Mitchell, that you answered no in this, in this context because at that time on September 5, Mr. Liddy had been identified as being involved and that you did not want to have any relationship uh, with Mr. Liddy's involvement or hiring? I don't think that would have been that magnitude or consequence. Obviously, uh, uh, Mr. Liddy was known to me, had uh, attended meetings in the Justice Department on different subject matters, including the drug uh, abuse law enforcement and so forth. That wouldn't have been of that magnitude. But in any event, your statement that you had no information whatsoever as to any of the circumstances on September 5 is quite different than your testimony before this committee. Is that not so? 
I believe that to be true, and I think the rechecking of the records and uh, the committee being kind enough to furnish me with a copy of the agenda that Mr. Dean provided and uh, further reflection on it has brought the subject matter very much into focus. Now, Mr. Mitchell, you testify that you asked Mr. Martian to make an investigation for you as to the Watergate break-in. Did those instructions include cooperating with the Federal Bureau of Investigation? The matter evolved. I do not recall coming back on the plane from California whether that was specifically discussed or not, but there was a policy within the uh, committee that they should cooperate with the FBI, and of course that was the basis for the discharge of Mr. Liddy when he did not cooperate. Well, did you ever give instructions that there should be cooperation with the FBI, uh, Mr. Marnian? I, Mr. Dash, I don't recall the specific words well, of it. But in any I event, would, did you? I would presume that it would be. Im well, did you consider did you implicit, include, implicit in his activity? Did you include yourself in that requirement to cooperate with the FBI? I would certainly believe so. Now, is it a fact, uh, Mr. Mitchell, that you were interviewed by Special Agents Rowan or Hill on July 5, 1972? Do you recall that? I recall it was an interview, yeah. Mr. Dash. I don't recall the date. Do you recall being questioned as to what knowledge you had of the Democratic National Committee break-in and your informing these agents that the only knowledge you had was what you read in the newspapers? That is correct. But as a matter of fact, on July 5, or by July 5, and that's pretty close to June 21st to 22nd, you've been given information by Mr. Mardian of what Mr. Liddy told you about that break-in. Mr. Dash, at that particular time, I wasn't sure whether that information was correct or otherwise. Whether it was correct or not, the, the, the FBI was making an investigation, and wouldn't you want to give whatever leads or information that they needed, having been the former Attorney General and knowing how the FBI investigates, so they could check that out? Mr. Dash, at that particular time, we weren't volunteering any information for the reasons that I've discussed right. so here that in numerous So that, in places. other words, your answer to the FBI was part of their decision that you made, and a very strong decision with the reasons that you've given to see to it that none, none of these things got out. It was the design of those that were involved to not volunteer any information under any of the circumstances. And do you recall being interviewed again on October 5, 1972, by a special agent, Lano? I don't believe that I was, Mr. Dash. This would be a telephone call interview. Do you recall the FBI calling you on a telephone? I October. believe, Mr. Mr. Dash, that that was a telephone call concerning whether or not the FBI should interview my wife. Well, that's, the, that's uh, my best on, on the, the FBI records indicate that you were asked again about what you had any information about the Watergate break-in, and you deny that you did. <clears throat> Mr. Dash, that is not the case. I think you'll find that it related, related to my wife and not to myself. Oh. Well, it, it is true that in, the, in, that, in that telephone conversation, it did relate to your wife, but the at least FBI uh, records show that uh, the question was put directly to you also as to any information, that, and that, that their records show that your answer was that you had no knowledge of your own. Well, then their records are absolutely wrong because the subject matter was limited to the uh, question about whether or not they should interview my wife or not. Now, Mr. Mitchell, do you draw the distinct distinction, and you've made it from time to time that it was your purpose not to volunteer anything, a distinction between not volunteering and lying? Well, it depends entirely on the subject matter. Mr. When you ask the direct question and you don't volunteer the direct answer, you might say you're not volunteering, but actually uh, you're lying on those. Well, I think we'd have to find out what the specifics are of what particular occasion and what case. Well, I'll go back to the February, the July uh, 5 question of the FBI as to whether or not you had any information on the DNC break-in, and your answer, uh, only what you read in the newspapers. Well, I think the newspaper accounts were a lot more productive than what I had heard from Mardian or LaRue and or, or Dean? Well, Dean, Dean was not discussing and had no knowledge of the FBI, of the Watergate break-in, Mr. Dash. 
Dean had no knowledge of it at all? Not he, that he had imparted. He spoke to Mr. Not that he had imparted to me at that particular uh, time. Uh, I think we've established well, that Mr. Mitchell, much later down the road the, the that, that he imparted to me the knowledge that he had obtained. Well, the information he received from Marion about Lydia is that, that um, Magruder pushed him into it. Now, nobody in the newspapers had ever mentioned that Magruder had anything to do with it. I'm not talking about it being in the newspapers. It was still an open question as whether it had happened or hadn't happened, because we were having Magruder talk, talking and telling us to the contrary. I know. And but advising the lawyers to the contrary. Well, uh, in any event, it seems to me that there, is, there are two instances that I've been able to quote to you in the record, you may have differed, where your testimony on September 5 on the civil deposition was diametrically opposed to your testimony before this committee. And all I've got to say on that, Mr. Mitchell, is that since you may have given false testimony under oath on prior occasions, is there really any reason for this committee to believe your testimony before this committee, and especially on the issue of whether you did or did not give final approval at the Key Biscayne meeting to the Liddy plan, uh, whether or not you had any knowledge about the President's knowledge of the cover-up or the participation in the cover-up, or whether you took any active part in the payoffs or cover-up of the Watergate case or any other part of the White House uh, horrors. Mr. Dash, uh, I disagree, of course, with your interpretation of those matters that you've just read. As far as the determinations of this committee, I think they can judge their testimony, my testimony, and make their own conclusions after my appearance here for four days or three and a half days, whatever it is. Well, I, I think that's true, Mr. Mitchell. And, and anything else I would say would be self-serving. Right. I think that's true. And actually, if one were to take your testimony on the various parts, which would include what you've had to say about the Key Biscayne meeting and what you've had to say about the uh, uh, raising of funds to pay off the defendants, and some other parts, that in order to believe your testimony, we would have to uh, disbelieve Mr. Magruder, Mr. Sloan, Mr. McCord, Mr. Reisner, Mr. Stans, and in some respects, Mr. Dean. I, dis I disagree violently on the list of the people that you've talked about. Well, and I would su suggest that uh, you wait until the rest of the witnesses that you're going to have appear, and they will test be testifying under these same uh, subject matters, and as Mr. Uh, uh, Senator Weicker yesterday pointed out uh, something unbeknownst to me about Mr. Ma uh, La LaRue's statement as to what transpired at the May or March 30th meeting down in Key, Key Biscayne. You didn't have any recollection that Mr. LaRue, in fact, had, uh, uh, had that a, a, a recollection of that meeting, did you? I didn't have any recollection that he had that recollection. Well, your, your testimony is that Mr. LaRue would agree or agreed with your testimony uh, that uh, when Mr. Liddy, uh, Mr. Magruder presented the uh, uh, proposal to you in Key Biscayne that um, uh, you just uh, dismissed it out of hand at that point. Uh, and, as, and I think Senator Weicker said to you that Mr. LaRue's testimony uh, would probably be a, a, the fact that you stated that it didn't have to be decided at that time. Well, this, Mr. Dash, is an affirmation of the fact that it wasn't approved in Key Biscayne. Right. I say it wasn't approved subsequently, but it's certainly contrary to Magruder's testimony oh. that it was approved no. in Key Biscayne on not, March not, appro not approved in Key Biscayne at that room at that minute. Uh, you, I don't know when you may have taken either walks with Mr. Uh, uh, Magruder or whether you spoke to Mr. Magruder outside of Mr. LaRue's presence, but I think we'll have Mr. LaRue's testimony. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Mitchell, I have just a few more questions. They may not be as good as Mr. Dash's, but they'll be a lot slower, I guarantee you. Let me ask you, uh, concerning Charles Colson, what was your understanding of Mr. Colson's campaign duties and obligations, specifically during the months of July and August? I'm sure they were many and varied. The um, uh, basic uh, contact at uh, 
uh, I had with him and the Committee for the Re-Election of the President had had to do in connection with the establishment of the Democrats for Nixon. I'm sure there were many other things that he was doing, but that's one in which uh, I had more contact with him than anything else. Let me ask you about your log again, Mr. Mitchell. Do you have your log there before yes, you? Yes, sir. Let me <coughs> refer you to some telephone calls that you had with Mr. Colson during July and August. Refer to a call to Mr. Colson on July 6, 1972, 10.05, I believe. Do you recall the substance of that telephone conversation? I don't, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, as you know, there's a substantial number of calls in here back and forth between Mr. Colson and myself, and the, uh, there's no way that I could identify the subject matter of a All right, so I'll probably be a little bit more general in some of these, in some of these other references, but that one was followed by a meeting with uh, Martian and, and LaRue. The call being made at uh, 10.05 and the meeting with Martin LaRue, I believe, at 10.10. Uh, I could see that there would be no connection between the two whatsoever. There would be no connection between those two? My, my belief would be that to be the case. All right. On July 7, you have another call to Mr. Colson. Uh, after having had a meeting with Mr. LaRue that morning. There still would be no connection between any conversations or meeting I had with Colson and LaRue or Martian. <clears throat> there would be in connection with some of the meetings in here with Secretary Conley and Clark McGregor and Governor Rockefeller and I think uh, Magruder sat in on some of them also. I'm sure you remember Mr. Magruder's testimony that when he received this call from Mr. Colson in uh, March of 1972, that LaRue was present in the room. Do you recall that? Yes, sir, I do. I do not recall the time frame involved, but I do recall the testimony to the effect that LaRue was uh, either in the room or in the uh, immediate vicinity of Magruder receiving the call. Did LaRue ever tell you anything about that conversation? Yes, he did. What did he tell you? Well, sometime long... I would have to believe it would be in the year 1973 that he told me of having been in Magruder's office or having been told by Magruder after Magruder had received the call from Colson that uh, <clears throat> Mr. Colson had called Magruder, told him that Hunt and Liddy were in the um, office of Mr. Colson, and that Mr. Colson uh, was urging Magruder to listen to Hunt and Liddy and get on with the, the Liddy program. I can't be any more specific than that. Did he state that uh, Mr. Magruder was any more specific than that as to what the Liddy program was at that time? I'm not quite sure who you're talking about. I'm talking about a conversation that Mr. LaRue had with me. Yes. Did Mr. LaRue tell you that from what he got from Magruder, that uh, either Magruder or LaRue had an understanding as to what that program was at that time? And I don't believe we discussed that in those terms. I think what we were both assuming in retrospect Going back over the time, it was the one of the programs that Liddy had proposed to, Mag to Magruder. All right now, we know also that Larue was president of Key Biscayne. Yes, sir. When Liddy presented in, in the same month, the same month that he uh, heard part of this conversation, was on one end of the conversation. A little later that month, he was in Key Biscayne when Magruder again presented this plan to you. Well, Mr. Thompson, let me uh, uh, try and point out that. Uh, I think that Mr. LaRue, uh, at least in his discussions with me on the subject matter, uh, thought that this telephone call had come after the meeting in Key Biscayne, not before. This is my recollection of what he told me. Well, then why did he, uh, why did he discuss this conversation with you at all that he had had, that he had overheard, or, or that when he was in the room, if he didn't think it had any significance? with what was ultimately uh, 
described as the Liddy Project as we know it now. Well, I don't know. What was, what, was the, what was the nature of that conversation? What significance did, did LaRue place on it, even in retrospect? Well, I'm not sure what his significance that he placed on it. It was when we were reviewing some of the things that had happened over the period of time, and uh, it might have arisen in connection with the uh, statements that uh, Mr. McCord made after the uh, appearance before us, Judge Sirica. I'm not quite well, certain of the date, but uh, in going back over the uh, chronology of these events, he advised me of his knowledge of the telephone call from Colson. Did Liddy have any other project? Well, Liddy, of course, as I always understood, it had an area of intelligence and information gathering that existed with respect to the committee from the time he came aboard, which is shown in the prospectus that, well, that we were not discussing fall, with Mr. Dash. That wouldn't fall within the, in, in the scope of Mr. Colson's campaign interest, would it, according to what you, you described his function just a minute ago? What interest would he have in seeing that the Liddy program was, well, was carried I, out if he was referring to that program? I was talking, uh, Mr. Thompson, to my contacts with Mr. Colson <clears throat> concerning the campaign along well, what about, issues. Other, what about anything? Obvi obviously, he had other functions in connection with the campaign. Do you know any other functions? Uh, could you be a little bit more specific? Yes, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Colson was very much interested in the issues in the campaign because he was at present at many of the meetings that I attended where the issues involved in the campaign were uh, discussed. I believe that Mr. Uh, uh, Colson was uh, uh, connected with or related to or knowledgeable of the so-called attack group that met and uh, decided positions with respect to the uh, candidate and the opposition. I'm sure he had many other none of, none duties. Of the, I'm not fully aware of all of them. None of the things you mentioned, uh, of course, have anything to do with intelligence gathering or anything of that nature, uh, do they? Not, not as such, no, sir. Well, even assuming that uh, that LaRue made this statement, that this telephone conversation came after Key Biscayne, and even assuming that it did, uh, you say it was 1973, sometime in, in 1973, before before LaRue told you about uh, this circumstance? This is, this is my recollection, Mr. Thompson. Let me refer you to August 8th again in your journal. Our notations indicate that you had a meeting with uh, LaRue at 9.31 that morning and received a telephone call from Mr. Colson at 10.30 uh, the same morning. Would there be any connection there? I don't believe that there is anything that I can recall where there was any relationship between Mr. LaRue and Mr. Colson and myself throughout the, this whole period. All right, let me, let me run through the list here briefly, and, and maybe we can be more general if you have no specific recollection with regard to any specific telephone conversation. I mentioned the July call to Mr. Colson. Uh, followed by a meeting with Martin and, and LaRue. July 7, you call Mr. Colson after meeting with LaRue. July 21, uh, you uh, had a telephone conversation with Mr. Uh, Colson. July 26, you had a conversation with uh, Mr. Colson between two calls with Mr. Haldeman. Uh, July 28, you had a telephone conversation with uh, Mr. Colson between meetings with uh, LaRue and Magruder. August 4, you had a call with Mr. Colson. Uh, August 8, you had a telephone call from Mr. Colson after meeting with LaRue. August 29, received a call from Colson. August 25, called Colson after talking uh, with Dean. September 8, you talked to Colson after talking with Parkinson. Do you have any specific recollection of the substance of any of those cell phone conversations with Mr. Colson? As I stated, Mr. Thompson, uh, there were two areas in which, or th actually three areas in which <coughs> Mr. Colson and I were discussing matters at that particular time. The first one, which spent more time than anything else, had to do with the establishment of the Democrats for Nixon. 
Were you still that actively in, engaged in the campaign? You had resigned on, on I was putting, I was putting out fires in connection with this subject matter. There was of course, we know the biggest fire that you had at that time. Yes, but we also had smaller fires in connection with the establishment of the Democrats for Nixon and the personnel involved. All right, Democrats and for I, Nixon. What I else? I think I have uh, testified or told this committee that um, uh, my responsibilities as a consultant continued in dealing with some of the people who were involved out of the Committee for the Re-Election, but in the election, uh, re-election of the president, such as Governor Reagan, Governor Rockefeller, Governor Cahill, and people like that. Uh, the problem that uh, developed was that apparently there was a great disagreement as to which Democrats should head up these organizations uh, in the different states. Mr. Colson was going one way, and at times Senator Connolly was going another way, and at times the organizations, the regular political organizations in the states wanted to make sure they didn't go that way, and frequently I was brought in to help uh, clarify the situation. Or any other areas? The other, the second area, of course, that was involved was it had to do with the uh, establishment of the labor groups that were supporting the president. And Mr. Colson and I had conversations on that subject matter. And the third one, of course, which involved the issues that were being discussed at the um, particular time in relationship to the campaign. When Dean told you what he did tell you about the, the so-called White House horrors, I believe you said he mentioned the DM cables, the, the situation yes, with the DM cables. Did he mention Mr. Colson in, in reference to, to that matter? Yes, sir. Uh, when he mentioned uh, the Bea Beard situation, did he mention Mr. Colson in reference to that matter? And I'm not quite that certain. I believe believe that uh, that to be true, but I'm not quite that. I believe certain. that's true. You believe he mentioned him with regard to that, and he did mention him with regard to to the DM cables. And you had this knowledge, and you uh, you had this list of of telephone conversations uh, with him. Uh, some 13 or 14 telephone conversations within a period of two months. Uh, did you ever discuss any of these matters with him? Ask him if uh, what Dean had said about those matters uh, uh, were true? No, sir. To the best of my recollection, I did not. What, De what did Dean say exactly about Mr. Mr. Colson with regard to those matters? With regard to what, Mr. Thompson? Those two matters, the DM cable situation and the Dita Beard or the ITT situation. Well, as I, as I say, these matters were discussed from time to time, and you would receive, or at least I would receive, the stark statement that such and such had happened. And from time to time, you would learn additional items about it, uh, particularly as to uh, what were the nature of the cables, uh, uh, what uh, how they had been tampered with, and uh, who were the players that were involved in connection with them. I know you don't want to make. Pardon me. I know you don't want to repeat serious allegations, uh, uh, matters of hearsay. When we have the opportunity, we'll have the opportunity to talk with Mr. Colson about them. We've already had the opportunity to talk with the dean. But I'll just ask you, considering matters those serious, when you had the situation on your hands, uh, the whole Watergate situation. Uh, doesn't it seem a little bit strange, at least in retrospect, that you never mentioned those matters to Mr. Colson uh, to find out whether or not there was any truthfulness to them? No, I was perfectly contented to accept Mr. Dean's statements on the subject matter. Well, I, I think it requires knowing just exactly what Dean did say then. Did he indicate that, uh, well, what did he say with regard to, to Colson's involvement well, in the well, DM? Let me, let me uh, go back and, uh, in history a little bit and pick up a uh, question that Mr. Dash was about to ask me before the lunch break. Uh, I had heard about the DM cables and Mr. Colson's involvement from a third party. Of course, I didn't know all of the details at that particular time, but I did know that Mr. Colson was aware of the DM cables and had talked to Mr. Lambert, William Lambert, about the DM cables. So that uh, what Mr. Dean told me about it at a subsequent date, 
fitted right into what I had previously heard about. Did he tell you the same thing, or did he tell you anything different about his involvement? What, did he supposedly do anything with the, with the cables, according to Dean? Now, are you talking about Mr. Coulson, Coulson mm -hmm. doing anything with the cables? Yes. Well, the, what Mr. Coulson was trying to do with the cables was to get Mr. Lambert to use them in a story. What about splicing uh, cables together? Well, that's part of the information that came out of the later period of time. Did Dean, did Dean refer to that particular aspect of it? Yes, he did. At what particular period of time, I can't uh, pinpoint it. Doesn't it seem even stranger that, like I say, assuming that, that the telephone conversation which Mr. LaRue uh, where he was present in the room occurred after the March 30 meeting you had with Magruder, but he would wait all this time from March of 72 to sometime in 73, and obviously you were meeting with him uh, continually also to talk to you about the significance of these matters. I, I believe you've already stated that Mr. LaRue, in effect, was a I get the impression anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, besides a political acquaintance, uh, a personal friend. You had him down uh, uh, at Cuba Skiing with you. That can, you, can, you can you shed any light on why he would withhold a significant uh, uh, matter like this from you when this was one of your responsibilities, in effect, for taking care of that Mr. Thompson, I'm sure that he was not withholding anything from me. I'm telling you that the best of my recollection, the first time I heard this story from Mr. LaRue was in the year 1973 after some of these uh, allegations were made, whether it was the McCord's material or whatever it was. It would be fair to say then, there, there have, you did mention when we were asking about uh, who might have been pushing Magruder, you referred to, uh, to uh, some of Magruder's testimony about the call that he received from Colson as a, as a possibility. Would it be fair to say then that during the period of at least July and August of 1973, 1972 that you had no suspicion whatsoever that Mr. Colson might have been the one who pushed Magruder? Well, as I've testified before, I have not to this day known who might have been or who might not have been pushing Mr. Magruder. Well, would, would the answer to my question be yes then? Yes to what question? said, would it be accurate to say that you had no suspicion whatsoever during at least July and August of 1972 that Mr. Colson might have been the one who was pushing Mr. Magruder to do the things that he ultimately did? That you had no suspicion of him during that period of time? Well, I mean, you're, you're talking with him on a, continually about campaign matters to start with. I, I would believe I could answer that, Mr. Thompson, by saying that if I had any suspicion of it, I would, certainly would have pursued it, yes. So any reference to Mr. Colson then, I, from what I can gather, is, is simply, at, at this particular time, is simply goes back to what Magruder's testimony was uh, concerning who might have been pushing him. Would, would that be an accurate statement? Well, it also goes to the point where I believe I have just recently testified here within the last number of minutes of the fact that Mr. LaRue mentioned the subject matter to me in this year. Mr. Mitchell, on uh, the night of June 17, 1972, did you have a conversation with Pat Gray? No, sir. Did you see him at any time during that day or no, night? No, sir. When was the first time you saw Pat Gray after June 17, 1972? I don't believe I've seen him since June 17. Yeah. Let me ask you to relate briefly to us. And by the way, Mr. Thompson, you asked about June 17th. All of these spec stories in the newspaper put it the following day on the 18th, uh, which was the Sunday, not the 17th. And my answer is no to that question, mm -hmm. too. I was interested in the 17th on this particular case. Let me ask you to refer back to February uh, 15 of this year. As I understand it, Mr. Richard Moore came to you, visited you, and had a conversation with you in, uh, in New York. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
Could you relate to us briefly the substance of that conversation? The uh, subject, general subject matter, other than the one that Mr. Dash has touched upon here, uh, had to do with the Irwin, Irvin Committee, this committee, the Select Committee, its activities, as how the, to some extent, the White House was going to respond, and how the Committee for the Re-election of the President and their personnel were to be handled. I think he carried with him a suggestion that it would be nice if I would move back to Washington and help with the personnel who were from the Committee for the Re-election of the President who were going to um, uh, appear before this committee. I thanked him very much and declined the suggestion. Uh, we've got into the question of, of whether or not uh, I would be interested in helping to raise support money. Uh, I didn't thank him for that, but I declined anyway. Uh, we discussed um, okay. we discussed uh, a number of other areas that, uh, with respect to the committee and its proposed staff, and as I recall, the question again of executive privilege, which was always being discussed, general approach to the subject. <clears throat> Let me ask you to recall as specifically as you can exactly what he said to you concerning money. Well, I don't know as I can remember the specific uh, phrase, but uh, uh, there's one thought that sticks in my mind, uh, which may or may not be the exact words, but it was uh, something to the effect you, you wouldn't be interested in help raise money in connection with these activities, would you? It was more of a question than it was a, a plea, and my answer to that was negative. What activities? The activities is the payment for the support and the legal fees of the people that were involved in the Watergate. Did, did he specifically mention uh, support for the people involved in the Watergate? Well, this was the, the general tenor of the subject matter, yes. Well, did you, did you have any talk about... Uh, or at least I understood that when he talked about raising funds, that this is what they were talking about. That's, that's the way you received it from your end of the conversation. Yes, sir. Did you also, did you also discuss the uh, committee to re-elect, how the committee to re-elect was going to function from then on? Yes, I, uh, I covered that generally in my answer did you, did you? It was discussed to the point that uh, there would be people coming up here to testify that uh, uh, they would be needing counsel. Counsel would be needing the backup of the documentation which was in the committee. Did you also discuss additional staffing? I think the additional staffing was discussed in connection with the other aspects of the litigation, but there was the discussion that the lawyers, and I'm talking about Mr. Parkinson and Mr. O'Brien, who had been doing legal work for the committee, uh, would be examining this area, the subject matter of the people from the committee who were coming up here to testify, and it was conceivable that they would need additional assistance. Additional lawyers who would be employed by the committee? Uh, I, I think, uh, Mr. Thompson, that it went both to the potential of additional lawyers as well as uh, uh, clerical or staff help to uh, take care of providing for the documentation that might be required in connection with it. Were there any other matters which you discussed there that, that would uh, possibly re require money or any additional money or where money considerations might be involved in any way? I don't. Did any I don't, of the ones you've mentioned so far involve that? I don't recall that, uh, Mr. Thompson, because it seems to me that there's one thing that the uh, Committee for the Re-Election of the President has, or at least the Finance Committee, has had plenty of money. All right. Are you firm in your own mind that Mr. Moore was, was uh, from what he said to you, referred specifically in his, in the words that he used to support money for defendants, or is, in retrospect, uh, do you see that that's the way that you took it? That's the way I took it, because as I say, the, the 
to the best of my recollection, it was a very brief, almost a, an aside, would you be interested in raising any more money? And the answer was negative. And raising any more money? Well, I think the, I better drop the more since I hadn't raised any up to that time. Thank you very much. You had not raised any money up until that time? That's correct. Was the talk of the money the major focus of the conversation, or was it, uh, did it receive equal consideration in your conversation, or was it a, a minor part of the conversation? A, a very minor. As I mentioned before, I described it as almost an aside, and I think that's proper terminology for the um, way in which it was put. There's one more question or small line of questions, Mr. Mitchell, and I think this should be asked, and if my memory serves me correctly. Newspaper reports uh, were that uh, on one occasion, uh, fairly recently, I believe, in a telephone conversation you had with a columnist, I think, that you indicated that you were not going to be the fall guy in this thing. Uh, was that an accurate report? It most assuredly was not. I think you're quoting the other side of the, the distaff side of the Mitchell family, not me. You didn't take the telephone and, and, and verify that fact then? I did not what? You did not take the telephone after that comment was made yourself and in a, and in a sense say, uh, yes, that's right, I won't be. I took the telephone to try and terminate the conversation, not to perpetuate it. All right, sir. Mr. Mitchell, have you uh, requested immunity before your appearance here today? No, sir. And, of course, have received none. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Thank Thompson. you, Mr. Mitchell. Any further questions from any member of the committee? Uh, Mr. Mitchell, on behalf of the committee, I wish to thank you for the extreme patience which you have manifested in what but is net was necessarily a very trying ordeal. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I might respond just briefly, uh, I certainly want to, and I'm sure my counsel do likewise, thank the committee, certainly the staff, for the many courtesies that have been extended to us, which has uh, made the coming and going in the uh, intermissions and so forth uh, much, much easier than they might have been otherwise, and we're quite appreciative of it. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So after more than 13 hours of testimony, the Select Committee has completed its examination of John Newton Mitchell. In a moment, the man whom John Dean described as his confidant at the White House will take the stand. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we pick up the action in the Senate caucus room, Senator Irvin is about to report on his telephone call with President Nixon. On behalf of the committee, I wish to make certain announcements. On July the 6th, President Nixon wrote to the chairman of the committee a letter responding to the request which the committee had made of the White House for certain uh, documents. The letter has been widely publicized in the press and will not be uh, either read or par paraphrased by me for that, now for that reason. On uh, this morning the com at uh, 9 o'clock, the committee had its fir the first meeting. It has held since the letter was written and received. On that occasion, uh, the vice chairman of the committee, Senator Baker, who all ma always manifests much wisdom, moved that, uh, the ch that the ch chairman send the committee to the White House by way of reply to the letter of, Ju of July the 6th. After a discussion uh, among the members of the committee, the committee unanimously authorized the chairman to send the following letter to the president. July 12, 1973, the President, the White House, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. President, I acknowledge receipt of your letter of July the 6th addressed to me with a copy to Senator Baker. The committee feels that your position, as stated in the letter, measured against the committee's responsibility to ascertain the facts related to the matter set out in Senate Resolution 60, presented the very grave possibility of a fundamental constitutional confrontation between the Congress and the Presidency. We wish to avoid that if possible. Consequently, we request an opportunity for representatives of this committee and its staff to meet with you and your staff to try to find ways to avoid such a confrontation. We stand ready to discuss the matter with you at your convenience. We would point out that the hearings are ongoing and that time is of the essence. We trust that this may be done very promptly. Very truly yours, Sam J. Irvin, Jr., Chairman. I would like to add that that letter was largely dictated by Senator Baker and with suggestions from the other members of the committee. It was forwarded to the President by a special messenger in a sealed envelope marked for the for the for the eyes of the president only. <laughs> the the uh, letter was accompanied by this letter, the president of White House, Washington, D.C., dear Mr. President. This letter is a product of deliberations of the committee this morning, authorizing the chairman to direct the letter to you to the president. It is the intention of the chairman to try to reach the president by telephone at midday today. Very truly yours, Sam J. Irvin, Jr., Chairman. The chairman did uh, contact the president by telephone and was assured by the president that uh, after certain pressing, pressing matters are handled by him on which deadlines are necessarily imposed, he will... Uh, I'll meet with the chairman to discuss uh, this question. The uh, committee adopted the following resolution at a special meeting today, held it at uh, 1 o'clock, resolved by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities first, that the committee is of the unanimous opinion that the committee is entitled to have access to every document in the possession of the White House or any department or agency of the executive branch of the federal government which is relevant to prove or disprove any of the matters the committee is authorized by Senate Resolution 60 to investigate. 
Second, that the committee is anxious to avoid any confrontation with the White House in respect to this matter, and for this reason authorizes the chairman to meet with the president to ascertain whether there is any reasonable possibility of working out any reconciliation between the position of the committee in this respect and that announced by the president in his letter to the chairman bearing date July the 6th, 1973 which will enable the committee to gain access to documents necessary to enable it to make the inquiry which is, which is authorized by Senate Resolution 60 to make. The uh, chair, chairman uh, expects to avail himself of the uh, promised opportunity to confer with the president in this matter in the hope that uh, we might uh, work out some re reconciliation of these two, uh, two uh, divergent positions and uh, thus avoid any possibility of a confrontation between uh, the committee as a representative of the legislative branch of the government and uh, the White House. Is any member of the committee wish to add anything to what the chairman has said? If not, the council will call the next witness. Mr. Richard Moore. I think we'd better go a little while. Mr. Moore, will you stand up, please? Yes, sir. Do you swear that the testimony that you shall give to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Now, I note that you uh, you will state your... Sit down. Be seated, please. You may state... Uh, will you please state your name in full, your name and address in full for the record? My name is Richard A. Moore, Mr. Chairman. My address is 4917 Rockwood Parkway, um, Washington, D.C. I note that you are accompanied by counsel, I take it. I'll ask counsel to identify himself by giving his name and uh, address for the record. Mr. Chairman, for the record, my name is Herbert J. Miller, Jr., 1320 19th Street, Washington, D.C. I am here representing Mr. Richard Moore. Mr. Moore, I also observed that you have a prepared statement, and I assume that you would like to read your statement before you are interrogated. I would, sir, and thank you for the privilege. You may, you may proceed to do so. Mr. Chairman and gentlemen of the committee, my name is Richard A. Moore. I am special counsel to the president, a position to which I was appointed on April 26, 1971. But today, I speak only for myself. For the 10 years following my graduation from Yale University Law School in 1939, I practiced law in New York with four years out for Army service. After the war, I migrated to California, where I was a lawyer and later an executive in the television industry and to save the committee's time, I will not recite biographical details at this point, but simply refer you to the resume attached to this statement. In California, in full after the completion of the reading of Mr. Moore's uh, statement. Mr. Chairman, also, you, if Mr. Moore doesn't mind, if you could uh, pull the microphone a little closer, we find some difficulty in hearing. Thank you, Senator Baker. Now, I was, maybe it's, is that better? Thank you. In California, I became a friend and supporter of. I would like to request that uh, there be order in the audience, and that anyone who wishes in the audience who wishes to converse uh, retire, so that their conversation will not disturb the capacity of the.
permitted to hear the witness. Thank you. In California, I became a friend and supporter of Richard Nixon and advised him on the television aspects of his 1962 campaign. And in 1968, I accompanied him on his campaign tours. I was then invited to join the administration. For a year, beginning in April 1970, I served as a special assistant to the Attorney General, Mr. Mitchell. I assisted him primarily in the preparation of speeches, statements, and position papers on current public issues within the department's responsibilities. In April 1971, I was appointed a special counsel to the president. My principal role has been to assist the president and his staff in communicating their positions in the most convincing manner to the general public. And since convincing communication depends on having a convincing position, my job necessarily involves me in the substance of particular issues in the public eye. But I do not have a line responsibility either on the communication or the substantive side. I serve primarily as an extra hand, uh, if you will, a source of white-haired advice and some experience perhaps whenever the president or the younger man with line responsibility seek my help. I shall be glad, of course, to answer any questions concerning any aspect of these hearings. But I believe that the most significant testimony that I can give to this committee relates to a limited time frame. That is basically the period from February 6, 1973, the day Senator Irvin introduced his resolution creating this select committee, to March 21, 1973. March 21 is the date when President Nixon, as he later announced to the nation, learned of, quote, serious charges, unquote, which caused him to begin, quote, intensive new inquiries into this whole matter, unquote. This was the day, March 21, when Mr. Dean, at my urging, went into the President's office and, as he has testified, told the President everything. Much of my testimony will involve my recollections about conversations with the President and Mr. John Dean. The good faith recollections of one party to a conversation often differ from those of the other. The Chairman himself addressed this point early in these proceedings when he recalled Sir Edward Koch's advice that one scratch of a pen is often better than the memories of a multitude of witnesses. And even the written word can be misunderstood. You may remember, Mr. Chairman, Elihu Root's insistence that in good legal drafting, the words you use must not only be consistent with what you mean, they must be inconsistent with any other meaning. Now, the chair reminds us that when two men communicate with each other by word of mouth, there is a, quote, twofold hazard in that communication. First, the man who spoke might not have expressed himself clearly and may not have said exactly what was in his mind. Secondly, even if he did express himself clearly, the man who heard may have put a different interpretation on the words than did the man who spoke them. The chairman's reminder is wise and sound, and I would recommend, if I may, with all respect, Mr. Chairman, that that sound principle should be known as Irvin's Law. In, <coughs> in December, and the typo here, it should be 1972 and January 1973, I was primarily involved with inaugural matters and recall no particular meetings or consultations with regard to the Watergate or related matters until February 6th. On that day, I attended a meeting in Mr. Ehrlichman's office to discuss our legislative position with respect to the proposed resolution creating this select committee. Except for the discussion at this meeting, I knew of no other planning or preparation that had been going on with regard to these hearings within the White House, and I was a critic of this lack of preparation. This may explain why I was called to the meetings in California on February 10 to 11. 
I had been home with the intestinal flu for two days and had been planning to take the weekend off and had reservations for my wife and family at the Greenbrier for the long February, long weekend of February 9 to 12. But late in the afternoon of February 9, Mr. Dean called me at home to say that we were both asked by Mr. Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman to meet with Mr. Holderman himself in San Clemente on February 10 to discuss the forthcoming Senate hearing. I therefore took my family and baggage to the far west instead of the south. Mr. Dean and I met on Saturday, February 10, 1973, at San Clemente with Messrs. Haldeman and Ehrlichman in Mr. Ehrlichman's office from 10.30 or 11 in the morning until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. On Sunday, we went to Mr. Haldeman's cottage at La Costa. All four of us were present for the majority of the time. One or more of us would leave the group on occasion to make a telephone call or perform some other function. <laughs> Summarizing these meetings is difficult because they involved about eight hours of conversation with none of the participants adhering to any strict agenda. In addition, the many things that were said during these sessions were heard by anywhere from two to four people, depending on who was absent at the moment. Each person with a different background or degree of knowledge or point of view. It was, if you will, a situation where Irvin's law applied to the fourth power. With that prelude, let me now give you my best recollection of what transpired while I was present. At the outset, Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman, and I parenthetically, I sometimes find it hard to recall which was which, asked asked Mr. Dean and me what we had been doing to prepare for the hearings. The answer was nothing. The focus of, the, of these hearings, they said, would be the activities of the committee to re-elect the president, and it would be the committee that would have the primary responsibility for the defense. Had we had any, had we had any discussions, or as they put it, any input from John Mitchell? The answer was no. Either Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman then said that in that case, Dick Moore ought to sit down with John Mitchell as soon as he could and fill him in on the things that we discuss here. And get Mr.
suit, the federal district judge, uh, and that both Mr. Parkinson and Mr. McPhee had told him personally that Judge Ritchie would be helpful. Now, was Mr. McPhee serving in any helpful role with regard to uh, Judge Ritchie in your discussions? None that I know other than the, than the fact that Romer McPhee apparently knew Judge Ritchie and uh, contributed to the intelligence as to how he thought that Judge Ritchie might handle a case and what the, his attitudes might be with respect to different motions and matters of that, just like you'd discuss any other judge that well, how, how would, might be handling a case. How would Roma Fee uh, be a special uh, as, uh, advisor or special significance in his, pre uh, his presence at these meetings in regard to how Judge Ritchie might act? Well, I don't think there's anything special about it. It was the fact that he attended the meetings and had known Judge Ritchie apparently for a long time and expressed opinions as to what he thought his activities might be in the case. Well, everybody there knew then that uh, Mr. McPhee actually did know Judge Ritchie and was a very good friend of Judge Ritchie's. Oh, yes, no question about that. And wasn't that actually the major reason why Mr. McPhee was attending those meetings, is to give you this kind of opinion as to what to expect <coughs> from, Mr., from uh, Judge no, Ritchie? No, Mr. Dash. Uh, he was attending those meetings, I think, primarily at the request of Mr. Stans. He had uh, been brought in by Mr. Stans originally, and I think he was sitting in and helping on behalf of Mr. Stans' interests. Well, now, you testified before the committee, I think, before uh, to sen several of Senator's questions, that you would have engage in practically anything uh, to um, uh, keep the lid on so as to assure the president's election. Would, would, would it really have... Uh, 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 I don't think we should allow that one to stand. Well, I think I would I, sure. engage in practically I think, anything. No. Well, no, well, I think you limited it to uh, high, uh, high crimes and misdemeanors involving the president's office. I guess that directed to the language of impeachment and the Constitution, perhaps. But... Uh, and I take it that you would also exclude murder, or, although you have indicated you'd like to see some of the people shot in the White House. But uh, no, I, I, no, I didn't say that I'd like to see them shot. I said it might have been a good idea if it had happened at the particular time. Yes. Well, would it actually uh, would it would it have offended your concept of having to do everything necessary to protect the president and his uh, re-election uh, bid? Uh, to uh, see to it that you did get favorable consideration in the civil suit from Judge Ritchie? I don't think the thought ever occurred to me, Mr. Dash, until you've just put the question and I can't answer. Other you than the thought never, never occurred to you? Never occurred to me that there would be any improper approach to a judge because, in my opinion, that's the quickest way to get the opposite results. Is that, uh, well, in some cases, isn't that true? Uh, you're, not, you're not saying that there have never been successful approaches to judges, are you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, I understand that uh, some of the uh, cases, or case books and the criminal laws are filled with such activities, but uh, it would have been my opinion that it would have been absolutely nonproductive. Uh, well, uh, and Mr. D never, never reported to you about uh, the... Um, statements that he says Mr. McPhee made to him or Mr. Parkinson made to him? In the context... In the context that, that Mr. McPhee was having private that conversations? somebody, as, as I think you put it, was f fixing the judge? Well, I think Mr. Mr. Uh, Dean uh, preferred to use the word had influence with the judge. Well, I have no knowledge from anybody that there was ever any influence exerted upon Judge Ritchie in connection with the civil litigation that he handled, and that included, of course, not only the original case but the other, other two cases that were filed. Did you ever uh, at any time uh, while you were Attorney General send any representative to the Supreme Court on a wiretapping case? No. I've read that story in the newspaper and it is uh, absolutely incredible. I don't know how it possibly could have gotten started. All right. Now, uh, in, uh, therefore, in your sort of standards that you would use to do anything to keep the lid on so far as um, uh, the uh, exposing of the White House horrors, is it that you say uh, as a matter of strategy it would be bad, but as a matter of uh, uh, 
what, in fact, if it was effective, uh, you would have done it. No, I'm not saying that, uh, Mr. Dash, because the question didn't come up. The decision was, wasn't made. Uh, didn't have to be made, and I would have great reluctance to uh, approach a judge to the point where on these ex parte activities is the way you are putting them well, to compromise the judicial system. Well, Mr. Mitchell, I, I'm very sure, and I would agree with you, that you would have had great reluctance. But on, on balance, and you've put it on balance here, uh, if it meant uh, the re-election of the President of the United States, President Nixon, uh, would that reluctance have been overcome? Oh, uh, that's a hypothetical question that I can't answer at the time. Is it hypothetical in light of Mr. Dean's testimony that Mr. McPhee, in fact, was being so used? It's hypothetical to the point that uh, I do not agree with Mr. Dean's testimony so far as I know about the discussions that had to do with the litigation that was before Judge Ritchie. But is it that you know that this didn't occur or that uh, you, so far as in your presence, that discussion didn't occur? Well, obviously, I have no assurance that it didn't occur, but I do have my own knowledge of what took place in my presence with respect to the numerous discussions we had about that litigation and the guesstimates as to what Judge Ritchie might do in connection with it. But you, you couldn't completely disagree with Mr. Dean if Mr. Dean says that Mr. Parkinson and Mr. McPhee told him personally that... Uh, uh, this was going on, and you weren't present. I mean, if I wasn't pr present, of course, no. obviously. I and you're not saying that, Mr. Uh, that any of these persons told you otherwise. Otherwise than what? Uh, since since uh, some of this has come p public, has any any of these persons, Mr. McPhee or anybody, spoken to you? Or you spoken to them about Mr. Dean's testimony? Uh, I have been advised uh, that Mr. Parkinson. I don't recall that I've. Uh, read it myself, but Mr. Parkinson has denied this publicly in the uh, newspapers. But, but I'm, I asked the question whether you personally talked to Mr. Parkinson or Mr. McPhee about this. No, I have not. We have this bulletin. President Nixon was reported tonight by his doctors to be ill with viral pneumonia and will enter Bethesda Naval Medical Center for treatment. Dr. Welder Takash said the president has, quote, no complications and is expected to remain in the hospital for at least a week with rest and medication. The president, complaining of discomfort in his right chest, summoned Dr. Takash at 5.30 a.m. today, and a preliminary diagnosis indicated the viral pneumonia. Presidential Press Secretary Ronald Ziegler said the president was running a fever of between 101 and 102 degrees, but with an excellent spirits, even though somewhat weak. In response to questions from reporters who were summoned to the White House this evening, Dr. Takash assured the press that the viral pneumonia is all that is wrong with the president. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after this pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is Peter Kay. As I reported a few moments ago, President Nixon has been reported by his doctors to be suffering from viral pneumonia. He will enter Bethesda Naval Medical Center for treatment for about a week. As we go back to the hearings, Committee Counsel Sam Dash is going to start with executive clemency and then move into those so-called White House horrors. Now, would, would you clarify how you heard about Tolson's discussion of executive clemency with Hunt? I think so far the testimony seems to be that you overheard it. And, and I'm not sure, and I'm not sure the record's clear as to how you overheard it. Who was present? Who was telling you this? I think my testimony and my recollection is that it was either John Dean or Mr. O'Brien. Uh, and it probably was John Dean because he was more closely related to it. And the recollection I have is that Mr. Hunt, in connection with his discussions, whether they were going through his counsel, Mr. Bittman, directly to Mr. Colson, or directly to Mr. Colson, but anyway, to Colson, the bottom line that I recall in connection with it was that Mr. Hunt wanted assurances from Mr. Colson with respect to executive clemency. And did you hear, from whether it be Mr. Dean or Mr. O'Brien, that uh, Mr. Hunt got some assurances from Mr. Colson? Uh, I, b I believe that my recollection is that there were assurances that Mr. Hunt would have executive clemency. Now, you know, Mr. Mitchell, that the only person who could grant executive clemency is the President of the United States. Now, when you heard that, did you inquire of anybody whether or not the President of the United States had authorized such assurances to be made? I'm well aware, Mr. Dash, that the President is the only one who can exercise the power. It was not in that context. It was in the context that Mr. Colson would exercise his best efforts to obtain the executive clemency. Do you know whether he ever did so exercise his best efforts for the President? I have no idea, sir. Did you ever hear whether or not he did? Only through uh, the discussions of Mr. Dean and his statement. That's the only knowledge That's the first I have. time that you heard about That's it That's the first Mr. time Dean's I've statement. heard of the subject matter. Uh, when, Mr. Mitchell, when were, when was the last time you had a communication from the President or someone on behalf of the President of the United States? Well, the last meeting I had with the President I'm not was, restricting that question, Mr. Mitchell, to a no, meeting. I understand. I've, but it was in two parts, as yeah. I recall. Uh, was on the 22nd of March was the last time that I met with the president. I have not talked to him on the telephone. Uh, the, will you ref not the rephrase, but phrase well, the, the second the part second of one, the or question? Any, or anyone on behalf of the president? Well, I don't think I've had anybody on behalf of the president, but I don't want to exclude the fact that uh, we have mutual friends who have had dinner together, and uh, uh, I have had uh, calls of con condolences with respect to certain matters that happened in New York by people who are very close to the president. How recently, Mr. Mitchell? Well, I guess, uh, let's see, what time was that? that was sometime in May, wasn't it? Well, so, so sometime in May, with respect to the calls of, of relating to condolences, uh, and I've had dinner within the past uh, 10 days, I would guess, with yeah. mutual were, they, were these former employees or, or members of the White House staff or just friends of the president? Both. Both. Now, uh, could, you, could you tell us who they were? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Robert Aplinoff. And Rosemary Wood was another one that telephoned me. And, and who did you have dinner with? Mr. Robert Aplinov. Oh. Uh, now, have, have you, Mr. Mitchell, have ever been promised any executive clemency or ever asked for it or any h help with regard to your present uh, pending matters? And <laughs> I, ho I hope, uh, Mr. Dash, that uh, 
With respect to matters in New York, the question is absolutely not. And with respect to circumstances down here, I trust that it's not necessary. Well, uh, I, uh, I, I, you've expressed a hope it's not necessary, but you haven't answered the answer. The answer is absolutely no. Uh, now, Senator Irvin asked you yesterday whether the president ever asked you if you knew anything about uh, your knowledge uh, of the of the ask you anything about your knowledge of the Watergate break-in or the so-called uh, White House stories, and, and you said, no, the President hadn't asked you. And Senator Weicker asked you whether March 22, 1973, when you met with the President the day after Mr. Dean uh, reported to the President that you might have been, be involved, that, uh, that whether the President asked you about it, and you said no, and that you didn't think that was peculiar, that the President didn't ask you. Weren't you surprised uh, that despite uh, your uh, own decision to keep concealed from the President what you knew, uh, he never once asked you what your opinion or views were on the Watergate matter or anything else that was so daily in the newspapers and daily involved in the grand jury investigations and before this committee? Well, Mr. Dash, you must remember that I testified that the Watergate matter was discussed at great length. Yes, in much different context to which I know you have, and about. I'm asking now not in that context, but in a much more direct context as to uh, who may have been involved, um, whether you were involved uh, after the president learned that uh, he, in fact, uh, that, that there was a possibility that you were. And your, my, your and the question is, uh, is your statement still that the, the president never asked you that? My statement is exactly that. And, and you I, still are not surprised that he didn't ask I'm you? not particularly surprised about it at all, no. Uh, if he had asked you what your knowledge was, especially before the election, would you have told the President? I would have had laid out the chapter and verse on everything that I knew about it. Now, certainly in 1973, you had a considerable number of telephone calls between March 13 and March 31 uh, from your home to the White House about I think about 88 calls. Now, are, are you talking about my home? Home or, phones. Uh, telephone calls from your home or and my office and our office. And the office. To the White House. Yes, sir. There's a particular series of calls that are very interesting, and, and perhaps you can help us understand what they were about. On March 31st, uh, 1973, uh, there were about 14 calls on that, uh, on the period. Uh, on that day, uh, there's a call at 12.31 a.m., 12.35 a.m., and 12.47 a.m., and then uh, there's a, uh, uh, a break and there's a call at 1.09 p.m. that evening, uh, 8.27 p.m., 9.01 p.m., 10.05 p.m., 10.41 p.m., 10.48 p.m., 11 p.m., 11.07 p.m., 11.17 p.m., 11.39 p.m., 11.56 p.m. It appears just from the calls that there was somebody, at least, sitting at a telephone calling a, a number of, uh, to the White House. And were, they, were these calls that you made, Mr. Mitchell? No, sir. We have another party in the family that does more telephone calling during those hours than I do. And is your testimony that you made none of these calls to the White House on the 31st? I, I can't say that I didn't make any of them, but certainly not in that range. Well, and let me uh, say, Mr. Dash, that um, frequently calls to the White House are not necessarily to talk to people in the White House, but to get through the wonderful operation they have over there, the telephone numbers of people that uh, are available to them. Well, the, one of the significance, I think, perhaps, of the number of calls, and I say perhaps, and I'm asking for your assistance, that these occurred March 31st, is that uh, if you look at what was occurring at that time, was that certainly by March 31st, the sentencing procedure before Judge Sirica had already occurred, Mr. McCord had come forward and 
given a letter to, to uh, Judge Sirica, and then it come forward to this committee, and it became public knowledge that Mr. McCord was accusing uh, Mr. Dean, Mr. Magruder, and yourself as having been involved in the bugging operations uh, of the, uh, at the Wargate. Could this, these calls on March 31 to uh, 14 calls to be different people at the White House to discuss uh, your, your, the, uh, this implication of you by Mr. McCord? Certainly not at that hour, those hours. Well, these, no, these were not late hours. Uh, uh, a call at 1.09 uh, p.m. is in the afternoon. 8.27 p.m. is the early evening. These are all early evening calls. 10.05 p.m., 10.41 p.m. The latest call is 11.56 p.m. That's not very late. Well, they, they were not my calls, Mr. Dash. No, they, and, you, and you say you don't, when well, you say they were not your calls, you're not saying that none of them were. I'm not saying none of them were, but there was no period of did you time. Make, did you make any telephone calls to the White House or any White House person uh, after the uh, McCord revelations came out, which named you? Yes, I'm sure that the matters were discussed with uh, Mr. Dean, I'm certain of it. Just Mr. Dean? I don't recall discussing them with anybody else until a much later date, and you tied your question to the, what you referred to as the McCord revelations. I believe that Mr. Dean was the only one in the White House that I discussed the McCord uh, letter. I presume that's what you're talking about, well, was, the was, letter to... Well, not only the letter, Sorica. but I think Mr. McCord then came actually forward to this committee in an executive session uh, uh, issued some statements which did name you. Well, would it have gotten out of executive session, yes, Mr. It Dash, and yes, the it public? Did. Yes, it did. It was in the public uh, press. Well, if it, if it did, I'm sure that it was discussed with Mr. Dean at the White House, and I do not recall discussing. Can you uh, tell us what the nature of your discussion with Mr. Dean was? Well, I've had so many discussions with Mr. Dean on this subject matter, I can't isolate that one. Well, wouldn't this stick in your was, mind, uh, Mr. Mitchell? I think it's one of the first times in the public press your name became identified with being involved in the, in the break-in. Uh, it, it would have been discussed, I'm sure, in the concept of uh, what was said with respect to the Zurica, uh, letter to Judge Zurica, or with respect to what came out of your uh, executive session as to what the facts or uh, allegations, I should, probably should say, were contained in the uh, particular items. Actually, following up at least that, that uh, McCord uh, episode, where your meetings with Mr. Magruder on March 27, where he was beginning to con be concerned about the unraveling of the operation with, so as far as he was concerned, your meeting with Mr. Magruder and Mr. Holliman on March 28, and your later meeting uh, with Mr. Dean, Mr. Magruder, and yourself on uh, the discussion of what Mr. Magruder was going to do about it in the grand jury. That's correct. There's no... So that this, this was coming to a head at this point, was it not? Well, it was coming to the point where the conversations increased as the information uh, came forth from this committee or from Mr. McCord or whoever it came forward from. And, and at that time, weren't you in active discussion with Mr. Dean and Mr. Magruder as to uh, how the grand jury testimony was to be uh, carried out? We had that meeting that I've already testified to, Mr. Dash. That's the one meeting we had on the subject matter. And was that the meeting where uh, Mr. Dean had indicated, at least, that you were going to uh, hold fast to your position, that there was no, no discussion of... Um, uh, electronic surveillance or intelligence at that meeting? Uh, I have never heard that. Uh, if you're referring to the memorandum that Mr. Dean wrote uh, after the April 10th meeting, uh, I do not believe that that's contained in there. With respect to the meeting that was held with Dean and Magruder, obviously not. There was no such concept discussed that there wouldn't be a revelation of the fact but, but that Mr. there had been discussions in the Justice Department on electronic surveillance. Well, if Mr. Magruder had to make a decision uh, as to what he was going to do, if you all three stood together, uh, he could continue to testify as he had. He had testified in the grand jury 
In August, he testified at the trial about those meetings. In fact, he said there was one meeting. One meeting had been canceled, and all that had been discussed was the election laws. Now, if all three of you could agree with that, he could have gone back to the grand jury and stuck with that. What he was concerned about, according to Magruder's testimony, is that if the two of you, if you or Mr. Dean were not going to stay with him, then it unraveled as to him, and he was facing perjury, and he'd have to go in and now tell the truth. That was not the basis of the discussion between Dean and Magruder and Mitchell on March 28th. It was the fact that there had been the two meetings that were shown in the logs, and that the question was whether or not Magruder had perjured himself by the basis upon which he had presented his testimony to the grand jury. Well, what did you conclude at least as to that? As I testified here yesterday or the day before, I told him that I wouldn't know whether he had or hadn't, but it depended upon what he had told the grand jury. Well, didn't he tell you what he told the grand jury? He told me in generalities with respect to it, and it got down to the question as to what questions he had been asked, and he couldn't recall that. Well, now, Mr. Mitchell, you've already indicated that you were debriefed by the lawyers as to what Mr. Magruder told the grand jury afterwards back in August. That is absolutely correct. So you know what he testified to the grand jury. I did not know what the questions were. I knew what he had testified to. Now, in early April 1973, Mr. Ehrlichman is supposed to have been assigned by the President to make a new investigation of who was involved in the Watergate break-in, and he interviewed a number of persons, including Mr. Magruder, Mr. Strawn, and others. Did he ask you anything about your knowledge of the Watergate? He didn't. To the best of my recollection, he did not. The meeting that I presume you're referring to was on Saturday, the 14th of April. Well, this is a separate meeting with whom, are you asking? Ehrlichman. Isn't that who we're talking about? No, no. I'm not asking you now whether or not. I know you did meet with Mr. Ehrlichman at that time. Did he ever, when he was supposedly making an investigation for the President of a new one on what happened, did he ever ask you, John Mitchell, what your involvement might have been? No, sir. Did you know that he had come to the conclusion based, I take it on Magruder's statements, that you had approved the bugging operation and were involved? That he had come to the conclusion. Yes, and that he had so reported. Yes, he told me about Magruder's allegations when we met that Saturday. So did he ask you about whether they were true? No, he did not. Why would he tell you that and not ask you about it? I don't know. You'll have to ask Mr. Ehrlichman. Well, then, did you? What did you say to him when he told you about Magruder's allegations? Did you say Magruder's a damn liar? It's a palpable lie? I think it was something along those lines, Mr. Dash, and that's the basis upon which the conversation was ended. Now, were you aware of it? You will recall that this is the one where we didn't sit near the coffee table, that we were over at the desk. Well, therefore, if there is a recording of that conversation, your denial would be on that recording. What I said at that conversation would be on the recording. I understand it's not a very good recording, but it would be there anyway. I think you'd hope at least it was good enough to include your denial. I would hope so. Did you talk to the coffee table or did you talk to the desk? Mr. Vice Chairman, I don't know where that little device is, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were a number of them around there. Now, were you aware that on the desk? Or had been, I should say. Excuse me. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt your discussion with the Vice Chairman. Were you aware that on April 15, 1973, Mr. Peterson and Mr. Kleindienst met with the President and informed him of a number of people who might be involved and that you weren't so included? I was not aware of that, of course, until I read it in the press. I was not aware of that until I read it in the press. Well, did the President then after that time ask you about your involvement? I had not talked to the President, as I previously testified, since the 22nd of March. I think you have constantly indicated your close friendship to the President, your loyalty to the President. I take it it's reciprocated. Would not the President have called you if he had this information and asked you, John, is this true? 
Well, now, first of all, uh, I have not expressed my closeness to the President. That's been an assumption that's been used down here. Uh, secondly, with respect to the question, I believe that he was having it investigated by the proper people under the proper circumstances, and it was not a function of the President of the United States to carry out such an investigation. No, I, I don't believe it was, but uh, as a personal matter, and you've indicated that uh, his references to Mr. Holtman, Holtman and Mr. Ehrlichman showed his warm, sympathetic character as a, as a personal matter, just a matter of, of human personality and the relationship you had with him as his attorney general and campaign manager, would you not expect the president to call you and say, John, what about this? I don't think that that would necessarily be appropriate under the circumstances. He would not want to ask from your lips along uh, what your views were. I don't know what uh, his motives would be one way or the other. I've <clears throat> found that, uh, or at least decided on the uh, uh, 14th of April, that after having learned of some of the occurrences that had taken place that I made a determination not to meet with him and not to talk to him further about the subject matter. Now, when did you testify before the grand jury and the new grand jury investigation, Mr. Mitchell? April 20, is it? Yeah, right. Sometime in that no. uh, Now, was your testimony there the same testimony you've given before this committee? Well, that's pro the testimony here is much more extensive. Yes. And uh, well, on the subject matters, the subject that matters are, are consistent. Are, is the same. Are exactly the same as they are. Uh, did you testify before the uh, first Watergate grand jury? Yes, I did. On uh, sometime in September, the day before the indictments came down, as a matter of fact. Was your time. was your testimony then the same as the testimony in April of this year? No, it was different because the questions were different. Were you asked specifically whether or not you were involved in the uh, meetings of January and February, uh, 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 January 27th and February 4th, on a discussion of, of uh, electronic eavesdropping? No, I don't believe, Mr. Dash. I don't recall, of course, the specifics of it. It was a very brief appearance. It was done almost on the basis of a, an apology, but the grand jury wants you up here. And uh, I don't recall the specifics of the uh, In other words, questions, but uh, nobody, to my recollection, asked me, was there a discussion of uh, electronic surveillance at the meetings of uh, January and February? Well, that would be fair to... Uh, excuse me. Yes. I think I have an obligation to note for the record that uh, the last six or seven questions uh, uh, under compulsion uh, uh, have asked, uh, and Mr. Mitchell has related uh, certain matters that he's given before a federal grand jury that's uh, investigating this matter. Well, that, uh, and of course, I think Ms. Huntley well knows that uh, even under Rule 6E of the federal rules that uh, nothing prevents a witness who testified before a grand jury to uh, tell a committee of this kind or anybody else what he testified to. As Mr. Baker stated at the beginning of this hearing, Mr. Dash, that Mr. Mitchell was not waiving any rights by appearing here, and he was here under compulsion. Well, I just note that for the record. Right. I understand that. Mr. Chairman, just so that this part of the record is complete, counsel properly states the reservation, the claim in the reservation, and the understanding of the committee, as I tried to express it at the beginning, on the reservation of rights. Yes. On the rule referred to by Mr. Dash, it is my impression that a witness is perfectly free to testify on the subject matter that he discussed before a grand jury, but not to tell of the proceedings before a grand well, jury as such. I think we did get into that, and that's why I noted my objection for the record. For my part, I have no desire to bring the witness into that situation, and we specifically disclaim that intent. And I, I have no intent. My questions aren't aimed at getting into the proceedings of the grand jury. Just to I just made a note for the record. Yes. Uh, I just want one final question on the earlier grand jury the first Watergate grand jury inquiry. Uh, would it be fair to say, Mr. Mitchell, from your testimony, that you were given some deference uh, before that grand jury? Deference? Well, you said it was a sort of apology uh, that they called you. Was it, would you consider that there, you were given some special deference, uh, former attorney general uh, being called before the grand jury? I thought they were very polite, Mr. Dash. Now, uh, going back very briefly to the March 30 meeting in the Key Biscayne with Mr. Magruder, uh, 
Are you certain, Mr. Mitchell, that while Mr. LaRue was in the room, you didn't leave the decision on the Liddy plan open? I don't believe, Mr. Dash, that my reaction to that resubmission could be considered an open question. In my mind, it was a determination that it was not approved and showed extreme distaste for the fact that it had been brought again to me in any form, shape, or circumstances. Now, when Mr. LaRue was down there, what role was he playing? Wasn't it that he was there to allow you to have some privacy and to answer the telephones down there? No. Mr. LaRue, of course, had been a friend of mine for quite some time. And he also, of course, was working with me in the campaign or had been working in the campaign and was going to continue to work in the campaign as one of my assistants. The house that we had down there is a very long house with two segments to it. It's almost two houses that are put together. Mr. LaRue came down and stayed with us. And the meeting that we had was in the part of the house where Mr. LaRue was staying and, as I described, it was a Florida room. During that meeting, wasn't it true that Mr. LaRue was actually on and off the telephone a good part of the meeting? I don't recall that, Mr. Dash. The telephones were right in the room where we were meeting. And how many times he was on or off the telephone, I have no recollection. Now, when Mr. Mardian debriefed you as to his conversation with Mr. Liddy on June 21st or June 22nd, did he not tell you that Liddy told him that you had approved the budget of the bugging operation and that his operations had been approved by the White House and carried out with the assistance of the CIA? Wasn't that in the debriefing discussion? That question was answered yesterday, Mr. Dash. And my recollection is to the effect that he did, that is, Mardian did tell me that Liddy said that the White House had, using that term as they had, had approved it. My recollection with respect to the approval of the budget, I do not have that. All right. Now, on that debriefing, and I will not just want to go into it just briefly again because there were some loose ends. There were a number of things in which you call White House horrors, and I think the record will be clear as to what are categorized as such, which Liddy told Mardian or LaRue and that they or Mardian told you. And they included, so to be specific, the Ellsberg break-in, I think, was the first one. Now, what did Liddy indicate to Mr. Mardian, as Mardian told you, who was involved in that break-in? To the extent that he referred to himself and Hunt, I'm certain of. With going beyond that, I have very no direct recollection. Did Mardian tell you whether Liddy said who had authorized that break-in? I don't believe that that was discussed at that particular time, Mr. Dash. Well, did he indicate that that was part of a plumber's operation? That either at that time or shortly thereafter, yes, sir. Did you know from Mr. Mardian or from what Liddy told you who else knew about this? Would you repeat that, please, sir? Did Mr. Liddy tell Mr. Mardian and Mardian you who else knew about this involvement other than the participants? As of that particular time, I don't recall it. Did you learn later? Yes, I learned later. And who else did you learn? I, of course, have had discussions with John Dean about these subject matters and learned more to the effect as to what the plumbers were and how they were operating in the White House. And did you – and who were the plumbers? Well, they were, of course, Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy were the operators, and they were apparently working under the direction of Mr. Krogh and David Young. And Mr. Krogh worked under the supervision of Mr. Ehrlichman, did he not? Well, Mr. Krogh, according to my knowledge or information of the White House organization, was assigned to the then domestic council of which Mr. Ehrlichman was the head. 
Now, the, uh, uh, did you tell anybody about, uh, not leaving the President out, did you tell anybody about the information you, you got from Mr. Morning? Well, Mr. LaRue was there at the particular time that Mr. Mardian debriefed me, and of course it was discussed with John Dean on numerous occasions when these further stories came out uh, from Mr. Dean as to the activities that have been carried on over there. And I think you testified you also talked about it, Mr. Holden and Mr. Ehrlichman. Yes, at a later right. time. Now, uh, the spiriting out of uh, Dieter Beard from the, uh, the town uh, was one of the other uh, White House horrors. Was, was it your information that Ms. Liddy said that she'd been kidnapped? No. Well, this what is... What do you mean by spiriting her out of town? Uh, this is now, again, the Mardian story. Yes, Or I, the I LaRue that. story to me. Yes. Uh, I d did not take it in the context of the fact she was kidnapped. Uh, that was the fact that they got her whatever way, with or without her consent, but I presume with her consent, got her out of New York, I believe it was, not Washington, but New York, and got her out to Denver. And uh, did Mr. Mardian tell you that, who, that Mr. Lydia, Lydia explained who had authorized that operation? Not to my recollection. Uh, who else knew about it? From Mr. Lydia to Mr. Mardian? No, I don't believe that was so, Mr. Dash. This was a uh, rather an outline of the activities that have been carried out rather than who were the uh, parties that uh, had authorized the activities. Right, now, the DM cables, uh, were these the so-called fake cables uh, which uh, purportedly linked Pres uh, President Kennedy to the uh, murder of DM? No, that is correct, sir. Yeah, and now, who told you about them? Was that, did that come from the Liddy discussion or from Mr. Dean? As being fake cables? Yes. That came from John Dean. And are these the so-called cables that were taken from Mr. Hunsafe? I believe them to be the same, yes, sir. And uh, were you aware or did you learn that these, also, these cables were ultimately given to Mr. Gray? No, sir, I did not. <clears throat> had you any prior discussions with anybody about those cables? Yes, I had. And who were they? <clears throat> I didn't realize that they were the same cables at the time. Mr. Lambert, William Lambert, came to me at some time in the early part of 1972 and said that he had been having discussions with Mr. Colson over in the White House concerning these cables, that he thought it was a great story. The problem, I'm sorry. Senate, and the committee will have to take a recess temporarily. The committee recessed for a vote on still another amendment to that Alaskan pipeline bill, then returned to the hearing room just long enough to decide it was time for lunch. They heard no further testimony before leaving. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPAC continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the hearing, Chief Counsel Sam Dash is picking up where he left off with questions about the so-called lowering of the boom on those involved in Watergate. The committee will come to order and counsel will resume my examination of the witness. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, did Mr. Richard Moore sometime in February come to uh, see you in New York for the purpose of asking you to uh, participate to uh, try to raise some funds for the legal defense of the defendants? Mr. Richard Moore came to New York on February 15th, and as I recall, we had lunch <coughs> to discuss a number of items concerning the forthcoming hearings of this committee. And I believe, if my memory serves me right, that there was a casual reference to the thought that uh, some people thought that I might be interested in that subject matter. And as I recall, I had uh, a very strong resentment of the concept, and that was disposed of in one or two sentences. And now, the subject matter, again, the casual reference was uh, seeking whether you'd be interested in raising funds for the legal defense of the defendants. That is correct, but that, that was not the prime I basis of the discussion or the one upon which we dwell. That was raised, though. And what was your reaction to it? My reaction was that I was without interest in the subject matter. Now, uh, I think in a in question being asked by the Senator Inouye to you, about whether or not after uh, information did come out concerning the Watergate and the President became aware at least of certain involvements. And I think a line of questions were put to you, Mr. Mitchell, about whether or not you considered what the President did was lowering the boom and using your language. Uh, and you, I think you indicated it was kind of a soft lowering of the boom. But, but was it not true that uh, Mr. Caulfield, who did leave uh, who went to work for the Treasury, and Mr. Krogh, who also left the White House, uh, became undersecretary uh, for the Department of Transportation. And Mr. Magruder uh, went to the Commerce Department, and Mr. Strawn became general counsel of the USIA. They may not all be there now, but that's how they left the White House and where they went. Was that was that? Uh, your understanding of the a proper way to handle people who may have been involved in the Watergate case. Mr. Dash, I'm not familiar with the job uh, that these gentlemen have held, particularly with respect to the time frame. But I would believe, according to my recollection, that they were placed in those positions before the period of the subject matter that the senator and I were talking about, and that they have subsequent, of course, been removed from those jobs. Well, they were certainly placed in those positions during a time when there was quite a bit of a cloud that hung over all of these people, including Mr. Magruder and uh, Mr. Krogh and uh, Mr. Caulfield and Mr. Strong. Well, I can't tell you when they, it seems to me that they were an earlier uh, time period and time frame with respect to them, I don't know what, when they were. Well, Mr. Magruder's case might be an exception. And that was really because it was Mr. Magruder who was coming to see you asking for help, and later Mr. Haldeman, and I think you testified that you would try to help him as much as you could. Uh, well, that was, that was a March, a March 27th. Yes, sir, that is correct. And Mr. Haldeman, I take it, uh, offered the same kind of uh, assistance. Well, I don't know what kind of assistance you're well, talking about, just the general well, I mean, fact jo that job opportunities. Well, the job opportunities at that time, Mr. Magruder was already working over at uh, the Commerce Department. Now, uh, you've told Senator Talmadge, and I, and I don't want to uh, restate it too dramatically, but I think you did make a dramatic statement in terms of what you thought was necessary to get a president uh, to assure the re-election of President Nixon. But I think you did state it kind of dramatically to Senator Baker uh, that you would pretty much uh, not want to allow anything to stand in the way in that re-election. Uh, re and I know that you 
drew, of course, certain exceptions to that. Would you have uh, included, and I'm now talking about the time prior to the election, uh, perjury as, a, um, uh, as, a, as an activity that would stand in your way in getting um, uh, the president reelected? Are you talking about on somebody else's part? Or your own part. Or my own part? I would think that that would be a subject matter, Mr. Dash, that I would have to give very long and very hard thought to. All right. Now, you've told us repeatedly during your testimony on Tuesday, Wednesday, and today that Mr. Mardian told you of his conversation with uh, Mr. Liddy, and I think the da date in which he debriefed you was, according to your testimony, around February, uh, ju excuse me, June 21st or 22nd. Uh, and that it was that debriefing that gave you all the information of Liddy's operations, which included the so-called White House bars and the break-in. Uh, now, have you ever uh, denied at any time that Mr. Marion uh, told you uh, about his conversation with Mr. Liddy? I have no recollection of having done so, Mr. Dash. All right, now let me, did you test, did you give a deposition on September 5? Uh, in the uh, civil case that the Democratic National Committee brought, uh, civil action number 1233. Yes, sir, I did. Uh, let, me, let me read you, uh, Mr. Mitchell, and I can send it to you if you wish to look at it yourself or counsel wishes to look at it. From page 45 of that deposition, question put to you, did you know whether or not Mr. LaRue had a discussion with Mr. Gordon Liddy about Mr. Liddy's involvement in the Watergate episode? answer by you, I don't really know. I believe that according to my best recollection, it was that Liddy, I mean LaRue and Mardian, one or the other, or maybe both, talked to Liddy when Liddy decided he was not going to cooperate with the FBI. I'm not sure which one of them. It was either one or the other. It may have been both of them. Question put to you. You were not present at the conversation. Answer by you. No, no. I have not seen Mr. Liddy since the middle of June. I've not seen Mr. Liddy or talked to him. Question put to you. Did either Mr. Mardian or Mr. LaRue report to you on their conversation with Liddy? Your answer, no, only to the extent that his services have been terminated in whatever way it was. Now, that was your testimony as of September 5, 1972, Mr. in the deposition. Da Mr. Dash, that relates to the basis of the termination of Mr. Liddy. No. Oh. The question put to you was, did either Mr. Moore or Mr. LaRue report to you on their conversation with Liddy? But if you go back to the basis of it, it had to do with the subject matter of the termination of Mr. Well, Liddy. then let me ask you again the question that was put to you. And, the, and I'll reread it, Mr. And, I, and, I, and you may look at this on page 45. Did you know whether or not Mr. LaRue had a discussion with Mr. Gordon Liddy about Mr. Liddy's involvement in the Watergate episode? And then you said, no, and I don't really know, but your t answer was that Mr. Marty and Mr. LaRue did. And the question was that either Mr. Marty or Mr. LaRue report to you on the conversation with Mr. Liddy. And your answer was no, and it was your limitation, only to the extent his service has been terminated in whatever way it was. Well, the answer speaks to the termination of the services. My, my response with respect to the other subject matter was equivocal because of my recollection well, at the particular time. Well, it certainly was equivocal because you've testified three days here that the important part of that conversation that Mr. Martin was talking to you about was the White House horrors <laughs> and the Watergate break-in. And since this was September 5, uh, 1972, before the election, didn't you answer no in that case as part of your uh, willingness to keep the lid on so if you'd answered yes and had to tell that conversation, you would have been opening the lid. Well, Mr. Dash, I have spent many, many hours reconstructing the events in connection with what happened during this period of time in preparation for the testimony of this committee. And that is one of the reasons why that I have more specific knowledge or better recollection of what has gone on that at the particular well, time in September when well, this we... Is September 5. September 5. It's closer to the uh, June meeting. It's closer to the particular time, and there are two subject matters contained in that uh, discussion there, one of which had to do, of course, with his termination, and the other had to do with the other subject matter. Well, you, you would be... in front of us with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Mitchell, your answer, no that Mr. Mardian did not uh, tell you anything about his conversation with Liddy 
uh, with regard to Liddy's involvement in the Watergate episode is, well, that, is actually quite contrary to your testimony on the oath before this committee. Mr. Dash, I would point out that there are two subject matters there, and the no relates to the termination aspect of it, and the other but that, answer is, as I say, Mr. Is Mr. Right I don't want to point. argue with you. The, no, the, 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 you put the limitation on. The question put to you was dealing with the questioning of Mr. Liddy concerning his involvement in the Watergate episode. And you said that Mr. Mardian did not tell you about that conversation, and then all you said was except about his termination. Now, all I'm asking you is whether or not uh, that answer no, that he did not, uh, that Mr. Mardian did not tell you about the conversation with Liddy concerning his Watergate involvement is directly contrary to the testimony you've given here. I still disagree with the interpretation that you've put on well, it, Mr. Dash. Well, it seems to me that... Now, that let me also point out that uh, uh, in addition to the hours that have been put in reconstructing these events, of course, there have been other matters presented to us that relate to these subject matters which have refreshed my recollection, including testimony before this committee. Well, your testimony at the time you said no there, that you actually had no recollection that Mardian had told you about the White House uh, horrors that Lydia told him? Could you that, have forgotten that's, that? that? No, that's not the subject matter of that question. That is the subject matter of the of question. Of White House horrors? Liddy's involvement in the Watergate episode. Well, that are, those are not the White House horrors, Mr. Dash. Well, uh, did, it, did you also forget about Liddy's involvement in the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters? I go back and stand on the statement, the answer that I gave you. I think there are two subject matters oh. there, and there are two answers there. Well, you, this statement was made on the oath, was it not, Mr. It Mitchell? was made under oath. That is correct. Now, Mr. Mitchell, uh, you've told... Uh, you've testified several times to the committee as to the circumstances, un circumstances under which Mr. Liddy was hired as counsel uh, to the committee for the re-election of the president, involving Mr. Dean's introduction, your interview with him on November 24th, and your hiring of Mr. Liddy. Is that not correct? Well, I think my testimony and my recollection is how it happened that after Mr. Dean had brought Mr. Liddy over to meet with me on November 24, 1971, and discuss the areas in which he would be working. Uh, we met, that is, Liddy, Dean, and myself, we discussed it. And then, as I understand it, that the suggestion was that since Mr. Magruder was then overrunning the committee that Mr. Liddy be put in touch with Mr. Dean, or Mr. Magruder by Mr. Dean, and that the hiring would, took place over there. Well, but you were aware of the circumstances on, under which he, how he was hired. I was aware of the circumstances of Mr. Dean having brought Mr. Liddy over to meet with me, and I, having said that it looked to me like he could be perfectly competent as counsel. And you approved his being hired? Counsel for that committee. Right. And Mr. Magruder hired him on your approval. Is that not true? I would presume that that had All followed. Right. Now, have you ever denied to anybody that you were aware of the circumstances of Mr. Liddy's employment with the committee? There was one occasion in which my recollection failed with respect to who actually hired Mr. Liddy. It is still my opinion that Mr. Magruder hired Liddy and not John Mitchell. Well, without the question of who actually hired him, the circumstances under, under which uh, he, uh, he became employed, uh, which would include at least your interviewing of him and your having some role. I mean, uh, have you ever denied ha ha knowing any of those circumstances? I don't recall, Mr. Dash. Right. Under the same testimony, Mr. Mitchell, on September 5, uh, 1972. The question was put to you on page 18 of the uh, transcript. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, do you have any information as to the circumstances under which Mr. Liddy was hired? A reference to the Committee for the Re-election of the President. Mr. Answer, no, sir, I have do not. Question, have you ever made inquiry to find out how it came that he was hired? Answer, have I made inquiry? Question, yes. Answer, no, I have not. Now, that testimony was under oath. Could you have 
actually been able to answer no to that question? Very, very easily, because I was not aware of how Mr. Magruder ultimately hired Mr. Liddy. Well, the question really wasn't that, was it, Mr. Mitchell? In the context that you have read it, and as I understood it at that particular time, the answer was yes. It was asked, do you have any information as to the circumstances under which Mr. Liddy was hired? And wouldn't a truthful answer to that be that I may not have hired him myself, or it may have been Mr. Magruder, but I interviewed him, uh, that um, Mr. Dean brought him over, I approved him. Now, maybe I didn't hire him, but maybe Mr. Magruder did. Wouldn't that be a truthful answer rather than, no, sir, I do not have any information? It gets to a point of degree, Mr. Dash, and the question as to the hiring, and the hiring was done by Mr. Magruder in the following month, and I had no knowledge of those aspects of well, Mr. Do you remember Magruder this, hiring them. Do you remember, did you remember that time, the um, interview uh, of uh, Mr. Dean when you no, asked that I, question? I had no recollection of the interview at that time. And you had no recollection of your approving uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Liddy at that time? Well, you're using the word approving. It wasn't, wasn't to that extent. It was the basis of a conversation that, yes, I think he'd be perfectly all right Mr. for Mr. Your counsel for the committee, and the ultimate decision was to be made by McGregor. Yeah, but Mr. Mitchell, you know that an agenda was prepared for that interview and that if you didn't approve Mr. Liddy, Mr. McGregor never would have hired him. You know that. That could very well be the case, or it well, might have been otherwise, because and therefore you did have Well, Mr. Mitchell, since you may have given false testimony under oath on prior occasions, is there really any reason for this committee to believe your testimony before this committee, and especially on the issue of whether you did or did not give final approval at the Keep This Game meeting to the Liddy Plan, uh, whether or not you had any knowledge about the President's knowledge of the cover-up or the participation in the cover-up, or whether you took any active part 
in the payoffs or cover-up of the Watergate case or any other part of the White House horrors. Mr. Dash, I disagree, of course, with your interpretation of those matters that you've just read. As far as the determinations of this committee, I think they can judge their testimony, my testimony, and make their own conclusions after my appearance here for four days or three and a half days, whatever it is. Well, I think that's true, Mr. Mitchell. And anything else I would say would be self-serving. In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. John Mitchell left the Watergate Committee today after doggedly maintaining his innocence for three days, but leaving a trail of conflicting testimony behind him. In the final moments of his appearance, Chief Committee Counsel Samuel Dash raised serious questions about the credibility of all Mitchell's testimony. While Mitchell squirmed, Dash bore in on the instances where Mitchell had given evidence on previous occasions which differed sharply from what he's told the Irvin Committee. After Mitchell, the committee heard from Richard Moore, still special counsel on the White House staff, who figured in John Dean's account of his gradual decision to end his part in the Watergate cover-up. Moore strongly supported President Nixon's contention that he discovered the full depth of Watergate only on March 21st of this year, but subsequent cross-examination revealed serious lapses in Moore's ability to remember. That controversy over the release of White House documents cooled a few degrees today as President Nixon agreed to meet with Chairman Irvin to discuss the problem. Peter Kay traces the moves that resulted in that invitation. Today, after two executive sessions of the Watergate Committee, a phone call, two letters, and a resolution, Senator Sam Irvin is on his way to the White House. There, at a date yet to be set, he will meet with President Nixon to discuss a problem that has plagued the Republic ever since the days of Thomas Jefferson and John Marshall, the doctrine of separation of powers. At first glance, the issue would appear to be a simple one. In this resolution, the committee said it was of the unanimous opinion that it should have access to every document in the White House and in the executive branch that bears on the Watergate investigation. The White House, on the other hand, has refused such access. It may be that a middle ground of compromise can be reached, such as that discussed yesterday by Irvin and John Mitchell. Perhaps documents pertaining to criminal acts or political activities. But, of course, that raises a point of who's to be the judge of what should be made available. The committee has said it's anxious to avoid any confrontation with the White House. But if it is unsuccessful, if that confrontation comes, then this matter will be on its way to the Supreme Court for final resolution. Senator Howard Baker, who is not going to the meeting, is an eternal optimist. He believes it can be worked out. I think there's still a chance that we can find a middle ground. I'm not sure what that is, but think back on the fact that a few months ago we were confronted apparently with the prohibition against the testimony of White House aides and, 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 and former aides and cabinet members. That's not with us anymore. For a while we were confronted with the apparent obstacle of the attorney-client privilege uh, to be claimed against Mr. Dean's testimony. That's not a problem anymore. Track record's not bad, and I persist in the, I hope not, hopeless optimism that uh, we can find a way around this one, too. You're suggesting the president may, in this case, then, back away from his letter of uh, the 6th. No, I think that the letter of the 6th states that he will not come up here and testify. He will not give us access to presidential documents. It does not say we can't talk to him someplace else. And it doesn't say all presidential documents. So maybe I'm manufacturing optimism, but I think there is ground for it. And I'm going to persist in believing there's some way around this dilemma until the contrary is made clearly to appear. Thank you, very much. Thank you, Senator. Despite interest in the continuing dispute over documents and two committee executive sessions today, the major interest was in the witnesses and what they had to say. To help you sort things out and plan your evening's viewing, we once again present NPAC's hour-by-hour program of the high points of the testimony. 
As the hearing opens, former Attorney General Mitchell is being questioned by Senator Daniel Inouye. The senator argues that not as much happened to those involved with Watergate after the election as Mitchell had anticipated. But Mitchell, who earlier insisted the president would want a thorough house cleaning once he knew what was happening, insists that the boom was lowered. And Mitchell rejects Dean's testimony that there was a plan during the fall of 1972 to influence Judge Charles Ritchie, who was handling the Watergate civil suits. In no way is followed by Committee Chief Counsel Sam Dash, who tries to determine how far Mitchell would go to keep from jeopardizing the presidential election. Mitchell says he would have laid out chapter and verse if the president had ever asked him exactly what he knew about Watergate. But, Mitchell emphasizes, the president never asked. Under close questioning, Mitchell admits that he approved the hiring of Watergate conspirator G. Gordon Liddy. Mitchell completes his testimony in the third hour, telling Dash that he refused a request in March of this year that he raise money to pay off the Watergate conspirators. He was followed by a series of announcements by Chairman Irvin about his continuing efforts to get to White House documents. Irvin says he talked to the president at midday and arranged a meeting for the two of them. His announcement was followed by the appearance of White House Special Counsel Richard A. Moore, who says he told John Dean that E. Howard Hunt's demand for more money in March of this year was pure blackmail. At that point, Moore said, he encouraged Dean to tell the president all. In the fourth hour, Moore admits that he conducted the White House probe into the clandestine election activities of John Segretti, and he relates how Dean said John Ehrlichman could be indicted for his role, otherwise unexplained, in the Ellsberg affair. Moore wasn't surprised or confused, he says, because Dean was often cryptic when he made such remarks. And now to Senator Irvin, who is about to open in today's view of hearing. In the fact that there's uh, been some discussion in the news media about uh, the meeting of the select committee on, on this morning, I want to announce on behalf of the committee that the committee did not complete its deliberations and will resume them at 1 o'clock today. Let's see who is uh, I believe, I believe some of the town is, uh, is uh, next in order. He has an additional question. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of expediting the hearings, I'll pass at this time. Uh, Senator Gurney. I believe that that's right. For the same reason, I'll pass to Mr. Chairman. Senator Norway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. I have just one question, and the question uh, relates to, quote, lowering the boom, end quote. I believe on March 21st, the president had a meeting with John Wesley Dean III, at which time Mr. Dean has testified that he notified the president as to his involvement in all of the irregular activities. On the following day, we have testimony to indicate that the president met with uh, high officials, staff members of the White House, including Mr. Dean. Now, according to what you have said, we would expect the president to have lowered the boom on John Wesley Dean III. But on the 22nd of March, instead of lowering the boom, testimony indicates that the president designated Mr. Dean to serve as his liaison with this committee. Is this your concept of lowering the boom? <clears throat> no, Senator, it most assuredly is not. Uh, I believe that the facts were that there was a discussion of Mr. Dean being the liaison with the committee to get certain areas straightened out. Uh, what actually the president was doing in other areas to, quote, lower the boom, quote, I'm not quite sure, but as we all know, things started to happen from thenceforward in the area where I do believe that steps were taken to the point where you could call it lowering the boom. For the record, could you tell us where the president has really lowered the boom? I think he has done so by his appointment of a special prosecutor, removing the people from the White House that were involved in the activities that Wasn't were Wasn't the appointment covered. of the special prosecutor brought about because of 
intensive pressure initiated by the Congress of the United States? Doesn't the record indicate that the White House and the President resisted this? It was the President's determination, and he was the one that made that determination. What were the causes of it, uh, I think we can all have different opinions upon, but it was his action that did provide for the special prosecutor. And in the case of so-called removals of staff members, the record seems to indicate that Mr. Haldeman and that Mr. Ehrlichman submitted letters of resignation, and the President most reluctantly accepted this and said publicly that these were the two finest men he's ever known. Is this lowering the boom, sir? <clears throat> no, but it shows the a streak in the president of uh, warmth and kindness that most people haven't attributed to him before, I think, could be considered in that light. I, I believe your lowering the boom statement is an important one, and that is why I'm pursuing this. You've indicated that you did not advise the president of the United States as to your knowledge of the facts involved in the matter before us because you were concerned that the president would lower the boom and thereby lift the lid off the scandal. Well, it's and I am trying to find where the president has, since learning of these activities, lowered this boom. It's my opinion, Senator, that particularly during the month of April and the succeeding intervening period of time, he has done exactly what he should have done in lowering the boom by removing the people from the White House and by providing for the special prosecutor. What people within, our, within our system of government, that's what the chief executive should do. Should With the exception done. of Mr. Dean, when he advised the president that he is going to do some talking here, he, I presume, was removed. But was anyone else removed? Well, Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman were. Oh, they were not removed, sir. They were not removed from the White House? If you read the public statement, they submitted their resignations, and the president most reluctantly accepted this, and in so accepting the resignations, uh, praised them to the highest. Senator, I have an entirely different interpretation of that. Besides Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman, did anyone else suffer from the lowering of this boom? Yes, I believe that Mr. Magruder was removed from his job. Mr. Krogh was. Uh, I don't know whether there are other people in, that don't come to mind at the moment, but uh, those who had been participants to the information of the president were removed, and the boom was lowered, and the judicial process is going on under an independent special prosecutor. This may be a matter of disagreement, but uh, I have done whatever research I could do last evening to find evidence of the lowering of this boom, and I regret very much, sir, that I just could not see uh, much evidence of this boom being lowered on any alleged participant uh, in this tragedy. Well, I believe that the matters that I've discussed and we've discussed and I've recounted here this morning is a lowering of the boom in the area of the prerogatives of the executive. And do you believe that with the soft lowering of the boom, the lid would have blown off? It has. And I don't think it was necessarily soft. But the lid wasn't blown off by the so-called removal of Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman. The lid was blown off, I believe, by two men in the Washington Post. Well, it depends on what areas you're talking about, Senator. If you go back to our White House horror stories, I think they came out from other sources and at other times. I thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions just now. Senator Montoya. I 
I have just uh, one or two questions. Don't you consider it that uh, the, the, one of the primary functions of the president on the Constitution is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed? He is so charged, Senator. Yes. And uh, you are, aren't you convinced that it, uh, rather you have testified that if you had uh, acquainted the president at the time you acquired knowledge of, the, of those matters with what you call the White House horrors, the president would have undertaken to uh, see that the laws relating to those matters were faithfully executed. I feel quite certain that yes. would have been the case. So isn't the inescapable conclusion that you exalted the political fortunes of the president above the president's responsibility to perform his constitutional duties to see that the laws are faithfully executed? I think that's a reasonable interpretation of the subject matter, and of course, in reflection, uh, it's a very serious one. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder uh, appeared before the grand jury uh, for the, his second appearance uh, about uh, on August 18, 1972. Now, your logs, if you have them, show that you saw Mr. Magruder on August 17, the day before, at 2.15, and that on August 18, the day he appeared, uh, you spoke to Mr. Kleindienst at 4 o'clock on the telephone, and you saw Mr. Magruder at 4.10, 10 minutes afterwards on that day. Uh, can you tell us whether or not uh, the discussion with Mr. Kleindienst at 4 o'clock and the 10 minute later meeting with Mr. Magruder after he testified had to do with his testimony in the grand jury? <clears throat> Mr. Dash, I have talked to Mr. Kleindienst quite a number of times during this period, and we have never discussed the Watergate matter in, Did you any, discuss in any form or shape or circumstance. And to answer your question specifically with respect to that date and that conversation, no, we did not discuss Mr. Magruder or his testimony. Uh, your, your meeting with Mr. Magruder, both on the 17th and on the 18th at 410, uh, was that for the purpose of discussing his testimony before the grand jury? I, I don't have that recollection, Mr. Dash. Uh, do, you, do you have any recollection of what the discussion was about? No, sir. As you know from my logs, I met constantly with Mr. Magruder about campaign matters and uh, other things, including the Watergate and the public relations aspect of it. And uh, as I testified earlier, there were meetings in which Mr. Magruder outlined to a group of us uh, the nature of his testimony that he was well, going it's, to it's give. Well, it's specifically because of that that I asked you the question, Mr. Mitchell, because on a number of occasions, you said, and especially during meetings with uh, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Radin, Mr. LaRue, Mr. Marnian, you did uh, at least have presented to you uh, what Mr. Magruder was going to testify before the grand jury. Now, on the day he actually testified, you met with him. On the day before he testified, you met with him. Uh, would it not uh, be consistent with your earlier discussions that you would have discussed what his testimony was going to be? Or was when he finally testified? I think, Mr. Dash, those conversations took place much earlier than the date in August that you've made reference to. If you will look at the logs, you will see, as I say, I met with Mr. Magruder almost daily during the whole period of time on many subject matters. Well, but all the way up to this period of time. Pardon? All the way up to this period of time. And thereafter. Yes. Uh, but I would, I'm now drawing your attention specifically to the day, did you know, by the way, when Mr. Magruder was going to appear before the grand jury? I have no recollection of whether I did or did not. I presume that I would have been advised, yes. Yeah. And, if, uh, and, and at the time, whether you knew it was the 17th or the 18th or when you knew that he was going to testify, wouldn't that be an appropriate time for you to discuss uh, what he was going to testify before the grand jury? You certainly were interested. As I said, Mr. Dash, I believe that those conversations took place much earlier than that. I know, but I think you testified before the committee, Mr. Mitchell, that you preferred and you certainly wanted him to testify in such a way that the lid would not come off. And you now knew he was going to be testifying. So whatever date you can recall at this time, he was going to testify to the grand jury. Would you not have and did you not discuss his testimony with him? <clears throat> Mr. Dash, I believe that the 
sequence of events goes back to the time when Mr. Magruder and Mr. Porter uh, went to Mr. Parkinson's office and put together their proposed testimony, which at that time they thought was going to be submitted to the grand jury in deposition form. I think uh, that was the middle of July, and that it was in that time frame and during or shortly thereafter that the uh, recitation of Mr. Magruder's testimony, or the nature of his testimony, was given. I, I have no recollection of having sat down with Mr. Magruder the day before, the second day before he went to the grand jury and going over with him. Well, did you learn what he at least testified to when he went to the grand jury? I assume that he had testified to what he told us he was going to testify to. Did you just assume? Didn't, didn't anybody tell you what he testified? Didn't, uh, didn't you learn that, in fact, he did testify as he did? Well, I, had, um, I believe... Uh, he had been agreeing I, to testify to I believe, Mr. Dash, if my memory serves me right, that he was debriefed by one of the lawyers who advised me as to what he had testified. So, in fact, you did learn? I did learn. Now, uh, he again testified before the grand jury on September 13th, and on, at that time, uh, it dealt with his diaries and the, and the meetings yes, sir. that he had with you. Now, you saw Mr. Magruder, according to your log, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Dean, at 12 o'clock on that day. Uh, did you have any discussion with, uh, with him about his grand jury at that time, on September the 13th? On September 13th? September 13th is when he appeared for his yes, third and I, final time. I testified, I believe, on Monday to the extent, to the fact that Mr. Dean, Mr. Magruder, and I rather briefly discussed the recollection of the meetings that had taken place in the Justice Department. And, and what did Mr. Magruder, to your knowledge, tell you uh, that uh, his recollection was and what his testimony was going to be? Well, if I can recall it as best I can, number one, that he thought that one of the meetings had been canceled. Uh, number two, that there were discussions of the election laws, which, of course, they both testified there were. Uh, and I think those were the essential parts of it. What was your response to that, Mr. Mitchell? Did you, what, did, did you respond to his recollection and what his testimony was going to be? I have no recollection of that, Mr. Well, did, you, did you disagree with him? I didn't disagree with it. No, I did not. Did you learn after that uh, testimony on September 13th what his testimony was? I believe probably in the same way in connection with yeah, the debriefing. Because your log shows that on, on September 14th you met with Mr. Dean uh, and uh, Mr. Magruder at 2.30 in the afternoon. Would that, you think, and you're at this point in time, that you would have discussed that at that time? It's quite conceivable, as I say, customarily, the information would come to us from the lawyers by way of debriefing uh, rather than talking to the individuals involved. Actually, on the very following day of that testimony by Mr. Magruder on September 14th, you uh, had a meeting with Mr. Ehrlichman at 9.50 in the morning. Uh, in that meeting, did you discuss uh, Mr. Magruder's testimony? I would sure that we would not, uh, Mr. Dash. I have not discussed Mr. Magruder's testimony with either Mr. Ehrlichman or anybody else in the White House except John Dean. Now, Mr. Mitchell, you testified yesterday that many of your meetings, and I think it was in, in response to the, uh, you're being asked about the various meetings you had with Mr. LaRue, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Dean, and Mr. Magruder, that you testified that many of your meetings during July, August, and September of 72 uh, had to do with the Democrats' civil suit and the strategies uh, for counterattack or how to, how to defend against that. Uh, did you also, during that time, Mr. Mitchell, play any role in uh, preventing the Patman Committee investigation from getting off the ground? We had many, many discussions on the subject matter, Mr. Dash. Well, well, did, you, did we, you make any recommendations as to how to deal with the Patman Committee? Well, the only way to deal with the Patman Committee is it evolved was to make a determination as to whether or not there were enough votes to eliminate the subpoena. And how did you resolve that? Well, I think it was resolved mainly by uh, people in the White House liaison and other individuals talking to members of the committee or subcommittee, whichever it was, of the Patman Committee. And it turned out that there were not enough votes to... Uh, it turned out there were not enough votes, and of course there was 
as I think has been put in uh, evidence here through one of Mr. Dean's exhibit uh, letter from the Justice Department in which they preferred not to have such hearings held pending the uh, uh, criminal case that was... Uh, Did you at any time uh, during this discussion make any recommendations that such a letter be sent from the Justice Department to anybody? No, sir. I cannot... Uh, <laughs> having left the Justice Department, I certainly cannot uh, control what their activities no, that, that was not my question, Mr. Mitchell. Did you, uh, during your meetings in which this, this discussion came up, you said that a number of times, uh, was it your suggestion at any time that somebody, Mr. Dean or somebody else, uh, uh, arrange that such a letter be sent from the Oh, Department? excuse me, I misunderstood your no. question. Uh, most assuredly, we discussed quite widely the impact that a letter from the Justice Department on this subject matter would necessarily have on the committee and its membership. Now, uh, I'm puzzled, Mr. Mitchell, about your distinction between uh, efforts that you said you were uh, willing to make to sort of cover up the so-called White House horrors uh, that you've described and the, and the Watergate um, uh, uh, break-in and the defense against the civil suits themselves, uh, because you seem to draw a distinction about the activities that took you uh, away from the, uh, the, some of this uh, discussion of the White House horrors or other activities because of your being involved in the discussion of the civil suits. Now, actually, wasn't the strategy against the civil suits the same kind of cover-up activity? Since wouldn't it be true that full disclosure in the Democratic National Committee suit uh, could result in unraveling all the things that you wanted to, to be not unraveled? Well, if I understand your question, Mr. Dash, uh, it was our strategy to limit the progress of the civil suits as much as possible, certainly before the election. We knew that they would come afterwards, and of course the uh, uh, civil suits, of course, related to the criminal trial, which was subsequently, I believe, determined by the judge handling it, and there was a, a strategy to keep the civil suit suits from proceeding, yes, sir. And, and then the, one of the policies behind that strategy was the similar policy you had on the other matters of keeping the lid on from having these things come out. Well, this, of course, included the common cause suit and the whatever other, that other suit, the Nader suit, I guess it had to do right, with. Right, and, and with these discussions concerning what uh, the strategy should be concerning the civil suit, deal also with what kind of testimony should be given at the depositions? No, I think uh, not, not in, in the meetings that I had. They were handled by the lawyers with the individuals that were to testify. And I'm, Mr. Mitchell, did, around that same time, and I'm now speaking still around the June, late June period, and perhaps early July, but late June, did you at any time uh, after June 17, suggest that uh, the CIA might be, again, suggest not to the CIA, but to Mr. Dean or to anybody else in any of those meetings that you had, uh, that the CIA might be a good source for cover-up monies for, for lawyers' fees? <clears throat> no, sir, I did not. And, of course, uh, I think Mr. Dean testified, and I don't know whether his testimony is accurate or not. He started out placing that in my lips and wound up with it with Mr. Mardian. Now, this may be a perfectly uh, honest mistake on his part. There were discussions, of course, as I testified, I think, on the first day here about the questions, was the CIA involved? The newspapers were filled with it. The, the individuals that were involved had worked for the CIA. There were a number of such matters. But the uh, concept of the CIA's supporting or providing funds in connection with this activity was not discussed in my presence, to my best recollection. Uh, now, you're and, lying. And, and uh, excuse me, Mr. Dash, if uh, I might add to that, because I think we discussed it uh, on Monday, the meeting in which Mr. Dean places this conversation uh, having come from the CIA uh, meeting that he had. 
never took place. And, of course, I wasn't in the city, so I could not have heard of his discussions about CIA support. But it's your testimony that at no other day were you present in your meetings with Mr. LaRue, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Dean, or Mr. Magruder, any other persons who were meeting with you regularly, that a discussion took place by, with, uh, on your part or by any other body's part that the CIA might be a good source for funds? Not, not the CIA for the source of support, money for bail or defendants or whatever it is. No, there were don't. discussions or questions, really, about what was the involvement of the CIA. Now, Mr. <coughs> Mitchell, your log shows that from June 17th all the way to August 29th, certainly, and thereafter, but certainly to August 29th, you had almost daily meetings with John Dean, and sometimes twice or three times a day. And you knew, I think, from your testimony uh, before this committee, uh, what Mr. Dean was doing during this time, uh, that he was serving as a liaison between you and uh, Mr. Holden or Ehrlichman, or White House people, and that he was not uh, making any investigation of the Watergate case uh, uh, for the President. Uh, yet on August 29th, the President did make an announcement that Mr. Dean had made an investigation to give him a report. What was your reaction to that announcement, knowing having been meeting with Mr. Dean almost on a daily basis during that whole period of time? Well, Mr. Dash, I, I think your question provides an assumption that I'm not uh, willing to accept. Uh, it's perfectly conceivable in my mind, so far as the involvement of personnel in the White House are concerned, that Mr. Dean was making such an investigation as to the involvement of people in the White House. And I think that was the context of the statement of August, whatever date it was. Well, as a matter of fact, did Mr. Dean discuss with you what he was doing? He, uh, you said uh, he met with you regularly. He was at your meetings. Uh, and uh, if he were making such an investigation, would you not know about it? I think Mr. Dean was making an investigation with respect to the involvement or potential involvement of individuals in the White House in the knowledge of the Watergate break-in or participation. His testimony was that rather than be making an investigation, he was engaging in the cover-up. Well, I, I don't doubt that for a moment, as I have so stated here, that there was that aspect of it. Now, the cover-up is an entirely different thing than the statement made by the President with respect to the involvement of individuals in the Watergate affair on the prior to the June 17th or at the June 17th activities. And I think that was the thrust of the statement. Well, you know from what Mr. Dean, I think, has testified or may have indicated to you is that he did speak uh, to Mr. Strawn and known as, as certainly as um, uh, recent to the June 17 break-in, uh, June 19, that Mr. Strawn had admitted to him that he had destroyed certain intelligence papers. Uh, did Mr. Dean tell you about that? Yes, he did, eventually. Eventually? When did he tell you about I'm that? not quite certain. Was it before August 29th? I can't say that for sure, Mr. Dash, but he did somewhere along the way. Well, if, if he had, you would have been somewhat surprised that uh, and Mr. Dean would have said nobody in the White House. I think I would have been quite surprised if if that had come out. Uh, well, did Mr. Dean tell you personally that he made a report to the President? No, Mr. Dean did not so tell me. Did you ever ask him after the President's statement came out whether he made such a report? Yes, I discussed. I'm not sure that I put it quite in the form of that type of a question. We did have discussions of it, and he told me that he, of course, had been discussing the matters with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, but that he had not specifically made a direct report to the President, that whatever information he was providing was going through Haldeman and Ehrlichman, one or the other, I forget which. Uh, from that testimony, uh, from the information you got from Mr. Dean that he was reporting to Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman, was it your impression that uh, the President was being, mis being misled uh, by that route, just as you were misleading the President uh, uh, after your knowledge from June 21st to June 22nd? I would believe that that would certainly be what I, the impression I would have, because uh, Mr. Dean was not talking directly to the President. And 
under that assumption with the president then making that kind of a report, you still didn't feel it was necessary to at least correct the president, because now you've made a public statement to the people of the United States, which you knew was perhaps incorrect. He made the statement, as I recall, having to do with the involvement of the people in the White House with respect to the prior knowledge or participation in the break-in of the Democrat National Committee. And that statement, I think, was factually true at the time that he made that statement, so far as the information that he had. And I think possibly so far as the information I had, because I believe the strong matter arose at a much later date. But you're testing me now that you think that Mr. Dean told you about the strong matter after the report. That would be my recollection, Mr. Dash. Now, throughout your testimony, Mr. Mitchell, you also appear to distinguish the so-called White House horror stories, which I want to get back to briefly, but the so-called White House horror stories from the Watergate break-in. Now, you were willing to state that you participated in a cover-up of the former, the White House horror stories, but sort of distinguish that role or participation on your part in the Watergate break-in. Is this, Mr. Mitchell, an effort to develop a legal defense, or is it a real distinction to your concern? Mr. Dash, this is what I made as a decision back in June. It has nothing to do with legal defenses one way or the other. Well, then, if you considered, say, the break-in of Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to be a White House horror story, why did you not consider the break-in of the opposite party, the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate, a White House horror story? Well, Mr. Dash, that had become quite widely known publicly, and there were people in jail that were leading to an indictment. There was a grand jury investigation in connection with it. But the break-in perhaps had become widely known, but not all of the people who were involved, and wasn't that the essential problem? I don't believe that that would necessarily be the case, because it had come out into the open. It was public knowledge. It was being discussed widely. But with the other stories, it had not come out and were not being discussed, were not known, and, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it was directly in the White House. Yes, but if, in fact, it had become known that Mr. Magruder, the deputy campaign director of the President's Reelection Committee, or Mr. Strawn, Mr. Haldeman's assistant, or perhaps Mr. Haldeman himself had been involved, wouldn't that really be part of a White House horror story? It's entirely a matter of degree. Certainly the activities that we've described as the White House horror stories and the period over which they were undertaken is quite different from, and were not known of, is quite different from the fact that you now have, or did have then on the record and in the media, the fact that there had been a break-in at the Democratic National Committee that was participated in by some of the people from the Finance Committee to reelect the President and the Committee to reelect the President. To me, it's an entirely different circumstance. Now, Mr. Mitchell, in your testimony, through all these meetings, which are not up now, but on June, late June, July, and August, with Mr. Magruder, Mr. Marty, and Mr. LaRue, Mr. Dean, although you indicate that there was quite a bit of discussion concerning the testimony that Mr. Magruder might make and strategies that were taking place, that you appear to constantly be taking a passive role. Are we to assume that you are a passive man in this operation, Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Dash, I think that would be very nice if you would do just that. But I want to also point out to you that all of these meetings you're talking about, this didn't all have to do with Watergate. They had to do with other things. I know that they may have, but they did quite frequently have to do with Watergate. They quite frequently. And wasn't your opinion 
quite frequently a, uh, uh, a deciding uh, factor in so many of these things, or certainly sought after in these decisions? There's no doubt that I undertook many of the discussions in connection with the matters that were brought up at those meetings. Did you give any specific directions during these meetings? Well, it would depend upon what the subject matter was. Well, uh, could you give us any, any examples on subject matter that you might have given directions? Mm, I would have to go back and ref refresh my recollection on some of the subject matters that were discussed, uh, the specifics of them, in order well, to what, arrive what, at that particular All right, but point. would it be fair to say, then, that frequently you were an active participant and not just sitting in the room and listening? I was a participant in the discussions. There's no question about it. And also in the decision-making process. I'm sure that there was a census would come out of the discussions in the room, and I would be a part of that uh, consensus. Now, the, are you, have you drawn a distinction in your meetings with Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman concerning the strategy or concern of the revelation of the so-called White House horrors as apart from the Watergate break-in? I don't understand your question. Well, you, you, I think your testimony is that you did meet with Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman and discuss with them. And I think your testimony, you said from time to time, that was sometime later on. Standard and when asked, you said that was in July. Sometime in July, uh, you did discuss with Mr. Hall and Ehrlichman the problems involved in the uh, Ellsberg break-in matter and all the other matters you have categorized as White House horrors. I didn't, uh, excuse me, Mr. Dash, I don't believe that I said that I discussed them with Ehrlichman and Haldeman in July. I think, you, well, that, I think the, the record is so, but I think that you did say that you did discuss that later, you said, in, in, later. in July. I, I, I don't recall that they were discussed as early as that. I think it was much okay. later on down the road that no, I we think discussed. The, the distinction, at least I recall from the record, is that you said that as far as the Watergate break-in, you didn't really talk to them about that till 1973. Uh, but and as to the White House horror activities, uh, you did speak to Mr. Hall and Ehrlichman in 1972. That is correct, sir. And in those discussions, were those discussions concerned with the strategy to keep the lid on? There was no question about the fact that we discussed the problems that would arise if um, the parties that had been involved in those activities in the White House uh, were to come forward with all of the conversations and all of the discussions and all of the information that they had relating to them. And specifically in this particular context, the parties that you were most concerned with, I take it, were the two defendants uh, under indictment, Mr. Hunt and Liddick. They were the participants, yes, sir. Yes. And, we, uh, and there was no doubt in your mind in those discussions that Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman were taking an active role themselves in uh, attempting to keep the lid on. Well, I, was, I would say that they had a very active concern, just like I did. Well, I didn't. I didn't hear your question. Uh, they, answer. They have had a very active concern, just like I did. And that active concern uh, was implemented. I take it. Well, in what way they participated, or in the implementation of it, I've heard more of it from the testimony up here than I knew at the particular time. Mr. Dean was was reporting back to you one evening. Mr. Dean, as I mentioned before, was reporting back to me certain things, but Mr. Dean, and I think quite appropriately, was not telling me ev everything that was happening in his conversations between he and the people in the White House. Why, why, was, this why was there a reticence on the part of Mr. Dean when, as a matter of fact, you were really uh, all together in a common purpose to protect the President? Well, I believe that Mr. Dean, being a lawyer, would uh, discuss the matters on a need-to-know basis and not go through all of the dialogues that he might have with parties in the White House, which he would consider probably an attorney-client relationship. Well, not attorney-client with Mr. Holman? I would think so. He was the White House counsel, and I'm sure... Counsel to the president. Well, he's counsel to the president, but of course he did... Uh, legal work and gave legal advice to other people in the White House outside of the president. But you knew what his actual role was. In what respect? Well, I think Mr. Dean has so testified that he did very little 
work uh, that the, the so-called title counsel to the president, White House counsel, doesn't carry with it that much of a uh, prerequisite. Prerequisites. Uh, basically, Mr. Dean had a kind of uh, low-level job at the White House, did he not? Well, uh, that was his characterization of it. The fact of the matter is that uh, my experience has been that the uh, Office of Counsel over in the White House does a tremendous amount of legal work it, just in reviewing the documents that come through there that have to be acted upon by the President or other people in the White House. I think now, whether you call that a low-level job or not, it's the, the uh, chief legal officer in the White House establishment. Well, I think his testimony was that his principal activity was putting out fires, and I guess this was one of the biggest fires that had to be put out at the White House, wasn't it? Uh, I hope there are none other that are any larger. Who else, by the way, when you mention others involved in the White House besides Mr. Lydian Hunt, uh, were you concerned or were being discussed about with, that Mr. Ehrlichman and Haldeman might have been concerned about? Well, at that time, Mr. Dash, according to my recollection, uh, it was Liddy and it was Hunt. These other gentlemen have appeared on the scene through newspaper accounts and testimony. Uh, they were not discussed at that particular time. Now, at a later time, uh, did you ever discuss uh, Mr. Crow or Mr. Ehrlichman's involvement in the plumber's uh, operation? I learned, I learned of, of when was that? The when, did you, when did you first learn about that? Uh, out of the uh, newspapers or the media or when a connection with the affidavits that were filed in the Ellsberg. Uh, the plumbers became knowledgeable to me shortly after the Watergate. Well, you uh, knew about, well, actually, shortly after the Watergate, they became uh, knowledgeable right. to you through Mr. Mardian's debriefing that, of That's Lydia. correct, and also Mr. Dean. Yes. But the specific activities of Mr. Krogh and others in connection with them were not known to me until later on, as I say, from the public media. You, you didn't know from Mr. Dean or, uh, that uh, uh, among the so-called supervisors of the plumbers was Mr. Krogh? I knew that I knew that he was one of the supervisors, yes. Uh, therefore, but wh what his involvement were in particular activities, I did not learn. Well, um, if, in fact, the plumbers did engage in what you called White House horrors and Mr. Crow was in a supervisory role, would you not have been concerned as to what Mr. Crow uh, was done, well, no. whether you learned about it or not? No question about it. Right. No question about uh, it. Did you ever ask uh, Mr. Crow or Mr. Hall or Mr. Ehrlichman anything about that? Did you ever probe that? I mean, you were concerned, Mr. Mitchell. I think the questioning came out yesterday from Senator Weicker that you were very much concerned in keeping the president from knowing about some of these matters because you were afraid that if, it, if, it, if he did know, that this might take the lid off and it might hurt the reelection. And you did answer Mr. Uh, Senator Weicker's question that you didn't do very much uh, to uh, keep the people who could uh, blow the lid off uh, from uh, doing so. No, I made this <coughs> response to Senator Weicker to the effect that I believe fully that it was in their interest as participants in it that they would follow that course without any necessity of any urging. Now, getting back to the question that you asked me and why I paused, Mr. Dash, uh, I, I don't believe that I can recall discussing the subject matter with Mr. Krogh. In fact, I'm not sure I've seen Mr. Krogh since the 17th of June. Did you ever discuss the matter with Mr. Ehrlichman, uh, for whom Mr. Krogh worked? We discussed the matter, yes, Ehrlichman and Haldeman and I have discussed the matter from time to time. Well, can you recall any of the specifics, the specifics of that discussion? No, it had the, the uh, uh, contents that I recall of the discussions had to do of, with respect to the facts and what had happened and not who were the participants or how that was what, what did Mr. originated Ehrlich or motivated. What, if anything, did Mr. Ehrlichman say to your best recollection about the facts? I, I have no recollection of other than what I've just outlined, Mr. Dash. And, and the facts, again, were being discussed and the concern that you all had in seeing to it that these matters did not become publicly known. That was the basis upon which I was discussing them, yes. Now, it seems clear from your log during this period that you were heavily involved in the civil cases. 
since you show a number of uh, meetings with Mr. Parkinson, O'Brien, and phone calls and meetings were also uh, had during this time uh, uh, with Mr. Parkinson, I take it, about the, park, uh, about the criminal case, because Mr. Parkinson, O'Brien, that's been testified, represented a number of the employees of the Committee of Election of the President before the grand jury or in their testimony or statements before the FBI. So this was all these meetings that also included Parkinson and O'Brien was a combination of both what the civil, uh, civil uh, suits and the criminal investigation. Yes, and of course, common cause and the general accounting office matter and the, the whole gamut of it. All right, now, uh, a new name begins to appear in your log, Mr. Mitchell, on August 7, 1972. Can we have the August? Um, uh, would you look on August 7, 1972, uh, you meet with a, a Mr. McPhee. Uh, you had a meeting with him alone at 3.40 p.m. Who is Mr. McPhee? <clears throat> Mr. McPhee is a lawyer here in the District of Columbia who was introduced to me by <clears throat> Mr. Maurice Stans, and apparently Mr. McPhee has advised Mr. Stans over on certain matters over a number of years. And he was, um, uh, I don't believe he was ever retained by Mr. Stans, I'm not sure, but at Mr. Stans' request, he discussed with this group and with me a number of the problems that Mr. Stans was having in connection with the uh, financial aspects of the campaign and the litigation that related to it. And, and the litigation, the, the, was this the common cause suit? Well, it not only was the common cause, but the fact that the um, uh, civil litigation went very heavily into the question, of course, as to where these checks came from and why they were in uh, the bank in Miami and uh, how they happened to be from Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. That, that would include the Democrat National Committee suit. Yes, well. sir. Yes, it did. Well, then, uh, the... I think the chart shows that uh, the McPhee began to appear more regularly at your meetings. Uh, I think he meets with you and Mar you, Marty and O'Brien at 2.40 p.m. on August 17. And then uh, there's an interesting series of calls on August 28, 1972. Mr. Paul, uh, with Mr. McPhee, I can't, I'll turn to my calendar where I can read it better. Uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you have a telephone call uh, with Mr. McPhee. What, what date is this, Mr. Nixon? August 28, 1972. Uh, we don't have that uh, in our diary. Well, uh, there's a your, your telephone log show that uh, there was. There well, was, this says the log you that we're log. looking yeah. at. Yeah. Well, go ahead. All right. We, we, whatever. Yeah. Whatever day. And then uh, does your log show a telephone call at 11:30 with Mr. Kleinstein? No. It shows uh, Bill Simon called Mr. M and T. Well, I, I have copies, so set of copies of your logs, and I'm looking at August 28, 1972. And at uh, 10 o'clock, it shows Roman McPhee called Mr. Mitchell and talked. No, sir. Maybe you have a different date there. No, I have well, Monday, August 28, 1972. We have Tuesday, August 28. Well, no, right. It's Monday, August 28. I, yeah. I think somebody got Monday and Tuesday mixed well, up. I'm we, sorry. We, we do have the right date now? Yeah. I, uh, now are we, we yeah, have a date now that corresponds well, I think, to what well, I think you have the same day. I think right. it's Monday, August 28th, right? All right. All right. Uh, now that we're on the same day, Monday, August 28th, there's a telephone call from Mr. McPhee at 10 o'clock, a telephone call at 11.30 from Mr. Kleindien, a telephone call with Mr. Dean at 11.40, uh, a telephone call with Mr. Halden at 12, Telephone call at 12:45 with Mr. Marion. A telephone call with Mr. Ehrlichman at 1:10. And then, uh, let me see. 
Holloman was at 12.45, excuse me, right. uh, Mr. Ehrlichman at 2.30, and then you had a meeting with Mr. Stans, Mr. McPhee, and Mr. Parkinson at 4 o'clock. Now, was there any relationship with that series of telephone calls during the day and the meeting at 4 o'clock? I would think there were none whatsoever, Mr. Dash. I would believe that in this time frame of August 28th was the uh, time when Mr. Gardner had made his demands uh, upon the committee with respect to the disclosure of the contributions, which resulted in a later date of the filing of the Common Cause suit. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it's been placed in the record the letter that uh, Mr. Gardner had wrote to the, to the committee or to Mr. Stans or whoever it was written to, but it was in this time frame, and I would believe that the discussions between uh, Stans, Romer McPhee, and uh, uh, myself and well, what? Mr. Parkinson would relate to that particular well, what, subject what, matter or certainly to the you civil that, litigation. Are you said that Mr. Stans had brought Mr. McPhee in at all yeah. a consultant. Yes, what, what role actually was he playing at that meeting? Was he retained counsel? Was he representing any party in the suit? To my knowledge, he was not retained and paid a fee, but Mr. Stans had great faith in him and frequently had him sit in on some of the discussions. Was he volunteering his time? That uh, I would believe that he would do, be doing that as far as I know, but as I say, there was quite a, a relationship with Mr. McPhee and Mr. Stans that had gone up back over quite a period of time. Well, now in September, your meetings with Mr. McPhee continue. On August 1st, uh, you, Parkinson, and Mr. McPhee. August 1st? August 1st, yes, 1972. Excuse me. I mean August, not September. We don't have McPhee no, August, no, August 17th is where you meet with uh, Mr. McPhee, Mr. Marion, and Mr. O'Brien. And again, on August 28th, you uh, meet actually with Mr. McPhee twice. Uh, uh, once you telephone, with, uh, have a telephone call with Mr. McPhee at 10 o'clock, and you meet at 4 o'clock with Mr. Stans, Mr. McPhee, and Mr. Parkinson. And then again, uh, there are additional meetings with Mr. McPhee uh, going on September 1 uh, uh, and, and other meetings. Now, these generally with Mr. Parks and O'Brien and yourself or, or some others. Uh, there are a total of nine meetings that at least our, law, uh, our reference to your log shows with Mr. McPhee. Now, during the per period of time the civil suits were underway, uh, the depositions have begun, have they not, during this period of time? Yes, they had, sir. And were there, and were there not plans discussed, as I think you've already indicated, and strategies to perhaps have the, uh, the civil suits put off until after the election? That was <coughs> certainly our desire, and I believe that uh, the court records can speak for themselves in connection with it. All right, now, was Roman McPhee, Roman McPhee, playing any active role in the civil litigation, especially the effort to get a postponement? None other than sitting in on the discussions that I'm aware of. Now, you're aware, I think, of Mr. Dean's testimony, that he said that he learned in a meeting in your office, and maybe one of these meetings in which he attended, when Ms. McPhee was there and others, that Mr. Romer McPhee was having private discussions with Judge Ritchie, who was the judge of the Democratic National Committee, suit, the federal district judge, uh, and that both Mr. Parkinson and Mr. McPhee had told him personally that Judge Ritchie would be helpful. Now, was Mr. McPhee serving in any helpful role with regard to uh, Judge Ritchie in your discussions? None that I know other than the fact that Romer McPhee apparently knew Judge Ritchie and uh, contributed to the intelligence as to how he thought that 
Judge Ritchie might handle a case and what the, his attitudes might be with respect to different motions and matters of that, just like you'd discuss any other judge that well, how, how would, might be handling a case. How would Roma Fee uh, be a special uh, as, uh, advisor or of special significance in his, pres uh, his presence of these meetings in regard to how Judge Ritchie might act? Well, I don't think there's anything special about it. It was the fact that he attended the meetings and had known Judge Ritchie apparently for a long time and expressed opinions as to what he thought his activities might be in the case. Well, everybody there knew then that uh, Mr. McPhee actually did know Judge Ritchie and was a very good friend of Judge Ritchie's. Oh, yes, no question about that. And wasn't that actually the major reason why Mr. McPhee was attending those meetings, is to give you this kind of opinion as to what to expect <coughs> from, Mr. from uh, Judge Ritchie? No, Richie? Mr. Dash. Uh, he was attending those meetings, I think, primarily at the request of Mr. Stans. He had uh, been brought in by Mr. Stans originally, and I think he was sitting in and helping on behalf of Mr. Stans' interests. Well, now, you testified before the committee, I think, before uh, to sen several of the senators' questions, that you would have engage in practically anything uh, to um, uh, keep the lid on so as to assure the president's election. Would, would, would it really have... Uh, 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 I don't think we should allow that one to stand. Well, but I think I would I, uh, engage sure. in practically think, anything. No. Well, no, I think you limited it to uh, high, uh, high crimes and misdemeanors involving the president's office. I guess that directed to the language of impeachment and the Constitution, perhaps. But... Uh, and I take it that you would also exclude murder, or, although you have indicated you'd like to see some of the people shot in the White House. But uh, no, I, I, no, I didn't say that I'd like to see them shot. I said it might have been a good idea if it had happened at the particular time. Yes. Well, would it actually uh, would it would it have offended your concept of having to do everything necessary to protect the president and his uh, reelection uh, bid? Uh, to uh, see to it that you did get favorable consideration on the civil suit from Judge Ritchie? I don't think the thought ever occurred to me, Mr. Dash, until you've just put the question and I can't answer. Other than the thought never, never occurred to you? It never occurred to me that there would be any improper approach to a judge because, in my opinion, that's the quickest way to get the opposite results. Is that, uh, well, in some cases, isn't that true? Uh, you're, not, you're not saying that there have never been successful approaches to judges, uh, are you, uh, Mr. Uh, I understand that the, some of the uh, cases, or case books, and the criminal laws are filled with such activities, but uh, it would have been my opinion that it would have been absolutely nonproductive. Yeah. Well, uh, and Mr. D never, never reported to you about uh, the... Um, statements that he says Mr. McPhee made to him or Mr. Parkinson made to him? In the context... In the context that, that Mr. McPhee was having private that conversations? somebody, as, as I think you put it, was f fixing the judge? Well, I think Mr. Mr. Uh, Dean uh, preferred to use the word had influence with the judge. Well, I have no knowledge from anybody that there was ever any influence exerted upon Judge Ritchie in connection with the civil litigation that he handled, and that included, of course, not only the original case but the other, other two cases that were filed. Did you ever uh, at any time uh, while you were Attorney General send any representative to the Supreme Court on a wiretapping case? No. I've read that story in the newspaper. And it is, uh...